the disaster is the one percent. Right. What are you doing ninety nine percent of the time? It's not shooting paper and steel on a flat range. Right. It's all the things that are collectively going to make you more successful and surviving in that one percent. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. This is a beautiful place. I did. I just did uh, my first. Well, I've done vlogs before, but it's the first format of this where it's like real time, and I recorded it, which is kind of cool. And I hope people resonate with that because it's cool to get the tour of the new shop. People love it. I think people love seeing. I mean, I, I remember when I was just a lineman and seeing just like the inside workings of some of my favorite companies, and I think it lets people behind the scenes a little bit. And I think that's part of been what people love about even a lot of your guys's content with with everything that you're doing people actually get to come physically interact mm-hmm. with your with your company see your building you know sign the wall do all the stuff and then actually meet your people where so many companies are so like kind of at an arm's length yeah you know? i just drove up from um from jackson hole and stopped at a gas station right outside of missoula and a kid came up to me he goes Hey, did, has anybody told you you look like Mike Glover? I'm like, <laughs> I'm actually Mike Glover. And he's like, oh, my God. And then I was like, oh, man, it's cool. Like, where do you work? And he works at a local shop. And he goes, dude, we follow you guys' stuff. And I'm getting new into teaching and instructing. And I was like, oh, man, it's super cool. And he goes, yeah, but I don't have experience. Like, you don't need experience. And we got to talk for about five minutes. And it's like that kind of thing. But when we grow up, very analog, just didn't exist. And I think it's really cool. I, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that why you were three hours late? One hundred percent. That and the, <laughs> and the typhoon tsunami. I, dude, I drove the Corvette because my Land Cruiser engine blew in my LC one hundred like this week. Yeah, and driving that car with slicks with three inches of rain on the ground, no off. Like I don't know what's wrong with Montana roads, but it like collects and holds all the water. Yeah. And we actually saw several cars hydroplane. It's because we, we only just got away from wagon tracks. <laughs> yeah. I believe it. <laughs> but it's so beautiful, that route from Jackson Hole. Oh, it's gorgeous. Dude, it's the it's the most beautiful route that I've taken. Well, when you were when you were texting me telling me that you were in a like terrible storm, gonna be delayed, then there was a, an accident. Uh I was envisioning you in some like overlanding over uber prepared rig. Yeah, I've been here. Little did I know yeah. you pulled up on the wrong road. You pulled up <laughs> in, in your Corvette, and I was like, oh, shit, he is definitely not prepared. Yeah, I was a half <laughs> inch off the ground. I took the wrong road and was running out, and I have this feature where I could lift the front end, but not the back end. Yeah. And I was starting to scrape, and I'm like, oh, man, what did I? M- Mike was on no a gravel options. road next to me here that was basically in the, uh, a horse pasture of my neighbors, which it is confusing because they have an open gate, like, 10 feet before my gate. Yeah. And you're Goes definitely not, gate. you're definitely not the only person that's ever done that. But yeah, I did make a comment immediately about land nav. Yeah. Your wife laughed at me too. Pointing, <laughs> pointing at me yeah. and laughing. Yeah. No, it's awesome. Well, did you buy a bunch of property in Jackson hole when you were down there? I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, cheap. A few hundred million dollars worth. Yeah. Um, nice. I couldn't afford a one square cubic inch in, in that place. Yeah. It's insane. The, I talked to a real estate guy out there, the, Median house in Jackson Hole right now is four point two million dollars. That is mind boggling. I passed a like like in North Carolina where I grew up, that house would have cost like fifty bucks. And I was like, what is that worth? Because that is run down. He's like, that's a million dollar home. And it was it was a sixteen hundred square foot house with a dilapidated, like everything was like just garbage. Yeah. There's literal trash in the yard. And I'm like, I wanted to knock on this dude's door and be like, you realize you, you just hit the lottery. You yeah. got a million dollar home here. Just sell this and and get out of here. You're good. Yeah, leave. It's crazy, man. The, the amount of wealth there. It's mind boggling. It's really mind boggling just how much the prices across the entire West. I mean, from Utah all the way up through Montana, Idaho, um, since especially since COVID. I mean, it's been progressively getting higher and higher. But I mean, since COVID, it's just exploded. Everybody wants to be... Again, I think somewhere where, you know, and we'll get to your book prepared, but somewhere where you actually can be prepared and, and actually can take care of your own future and, and actually have some self-sufficient, uh, a self-sufficient lifestyle. And I think people are seeing it in the cities and they're selling their places in California and they, they, they come up here, they see something's six, $700,000 and they think they're getting a deal and they're putting 500 grand in their pocket when they're all said and done or a million or it's insane. 
I think Yellowstone screwed it up for a lot of Montana. It hasn't helped. Andy Stumpf also. Yeah, he keeps running his mouth about Kalispell, taking those cool pictures of the lake. I know. He exactly. should tag like he'd be like West Virginia, the most beautiful place on the planet. Exactly. But instead, he's saying Montana, and yeah. and like I've always been a fan of Montana, and I got good friends all over the state, and I look at this place, and compared to Utah, there are some similarities, but you don't get the majestic beauty of Montana. It's just a different place, man. Yeah, it's pretty gorgeous, and it's it's definitely got. I mean, U- Utah definitely has you know, some interesting different topography, but I mean, you leave Western Montana, you head out East and it's that flat ranch land country, farmland. And then you get into the Missouri river breaks. And you, like every time I'm hunting in the Missouri river breaks, I think about Lewis and Clark and their team paddling up river for a couple thousand miles, paddling upstream in canoes through grizzly bear country and Indian territory. And then they hit that country. That's just absolutely rugged and rough thinking that when they break over the the continental divide they're going to see the ocean and all they see is where we're at now. Yeah. Just mountains for as far as you can see. I'm a I'm a big fan of Montana except for Billings. Yeah. Billings is the biggest shithole I've ever been to in my <laughs> life. I somebody said somebody said the best cowboy hat made is not Stetson. It is a Rand hat. Yeah. And I was like, "Done." I go. I'll go to Rands and I'll get a custom hat made because they size it and fit it the old right. school way. And I pulled up, and it had bars on the window, and it was in between a pawn shop and a, a abandoned refinery, building. probably. And I was like, <laughs> "What the hell?" Like, I was, there's no way this is one of the best. I mean, all the stars and all the famous people and cowboy, real cowboys go to Rands, and I went there and I was like, "What is this?" It's definitely cowboy country out there, but. Uh... We always joke on the west side of the state that out there you can watch your dog run away for a week. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> it's flatlands. Five days later, you're like, I should probably go get him. Yeah, it's it, yeah, <laughs> it's not like this. So, you say all this. Andrew, where'd you grow up? I, I might have been born and raised in <laughs> Billings, Montana. <laughs> well, I just talked to a law enforcement officer from Billings at uh, Nelson's place up by Andy, and he's a law enforcement officer as well, and, and these two police officers were doing something with uh, the local Kalispell guys. And they were telling me about all the shenanigans in Billings. And I'm like, oh, my. I guess per capita, it's the most dangerous uh, town in Montana. Yeah. Is that it gets, true? It gets sporty. Crime-wise. Yeah. yeah crime-wise. It gets sporty. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to really let that Billings one soak for a while before I yeah. turned to Andrew. Just a little bit. Andrew is over there gritting his teeth. Well, that's why you went in the military because you're like, dude, I didn't get the <laughs> hell out of here. Exactly. <laughs> and you're why you're here now. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, why uh, yeah, the Middle East felt like home. <laughs> 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 I love these deployments. It feels like home. <laughs> Reminds me of Belling. <laughs> is that your Lyman stuff? That's right my uh, my cousin. He, he jokes about, uh, he does, uh, when somebody came, how did they get the name Billings? He says somebody drove over the, the, uh, over the hill from the north part of the state where no one lives and says, man, look at all them billings. <laughs> so, <laughs> dad jokes. What's that stuff? Yeah, that's my lineman gear. Um, you used to wear that. Yeah, that's what I wore when I uh, climbed power poles and uh, was, a, was a professional stripper. Looks good. Working on electricity. Yeah. Looks good on you. Did you ever do that the stuff? stuff? I hang that stuff there to remind me where I, what I don't want to go do again. Yeah. Keep me working now that I'm a soft office guy up here. I heard it's good pay. It's really, I mean, honestly, being in alignment, if, if I had, if this all burned down in flames and I had to go get a job tomorrow at a thousand percent, go back to, to be in alignment. Um, you know, other than the safety meetings and the corporate bullshit, uh, every single day is something different. You go in there, you might be doing, um, putting in underground pipe downtown Missoula, right? And you're working around bunch of people and traffic and everything and it kind of seems like it sucks and then you get a phone call and it's like hey we got a tree in a line up on the pass near idaho yeah you guys need to take a snow cat and some chainsaws and go find it you know and uh or you're out on a right away and you can't find what the problem is and you call a helicopter and they come land there and grab you and you go fly the line and, th- and then you have to hike in with all your gear pack frames Ropes, rigging, all all the stuff because you can't drive to these structures in this country. And the same thing with a lot of the stuff that, uh, like Chance, uh, Jamie Nelson that works for Black Rifle. Chance is a lineman and he'll send me pictures once in, once in a while or Jamie will and Chance will be on top of a mountain 
climbing a power pole. And it's like, and it's a lot of guys say it's the closest thing kind of to the military when you're not in the military. Cause it's a, it's a brotherhood. Like your life literally hangs in the balance with your brothers that you're with. You have to trust what they say. You know, is this line hot? Is this, you know, is this electricity? Where's this line go? What this and that they're watching your back. I'm watching yours. We're in a bucket truck and you're two feet from each other. And there's 7,000 volts behind your head and you're constantly communicating, you know, Hey, Mike, watch your back. Hey, don't lift your arms. All right. You're in the clear, you know, and you're doing that back and forth and it's just this constant communication. And no matter how much you hate that prick on the ground, like when you're in the, when you're in the bucket truck, it's, it's a brotherhood. It's, I, I absolutely loved it. Um, but unfortunately, like you also have the corporate side of it and, you know, once you enter the office, all of a sudden you can't say bad words and mm. inappropriate things and bad jokes. So, yeah. Um, Which is why you give me this Bud Light. I appreciate this. Bud Light. <laughs> you guys have a, a it, whole fridge full of this. If it's you're free. not watching video, it's not a Bud Light. <laughs> Don't turn the podcast off. So let's get to you a little bit here. You are on, I guess, is this is this the, am I, I've always wanted to, I, you always see these book tours. I'm like, we actually have a guy here on a book tour, which is. It's so weird, man. It, it's what weird. is it, what is it like to have your own book for the camera here? We got it, prepared here. It don't Mike seem Gordon. no different. I mean, I wrote it, so it's like when I when I see it, it is cool because I grew up reading books. I yeah. mean, most of us did, and um, my big influences came from dudes like John Plaster, who wrote Sog and Secret Commandos and The Ultimate Sniper. I had that book when I was twelve years old, which made me want to be a sniper. Um, Carlos Hathcock's book, um, Marine Sniper. Those things I grew up with really influenced me. And I don't know how many people are influenced by physical books today as compared to when we grew up. Um, but it's really cool to know that that book is broadly placed where people read. It's on Audible. And that we could kind of influence people about this idea of preparedness. Yeah. Yeah, I... it First of all, it actually it kind of it gives me chills because I can't imagine getting to a spot where you actually have your own book. Like that's a, and, and what's amazing about it to me is like books are one of the very few things. I always say this, I say this kind of about knives. There's very few things in life that are passed down, right? Like in this world today, if you walk into target, everything you see yeah. is going to get thrown away. Yep. Literally everything you see is made to throw away. Yeah. In almost every major store you go in, especially target. Yeah. But Burn I mean, it down. targets, targets nice compared to fucking Walmart. Compared, <laughs> except for their underwear for little boys. That well, that's true. All this, all this shit going on. Yeah, yeah, geez, God, you can't turn towards any brand these days. Bud Light, Target, God dang. Uh, but anyway, the point is, is like knives and guns as men we generally pass down. Yep. And and then for women, a lot of times it's like artwork and jewelry. And sometimes that artwork and jewelry goes for men as well. Um, knives also with you know women's chefs knives and stuff like that. But there's very little we pass down. But books are definitely one of those things. Like, I don't know what it is about a book, and I compare it a lot to like an old knife with like a tip broken off of it, right? You've read this book 10 times. Maybe you've got this book from your grandpa or some book, and you've got it from your grandpa, and you're not even interested in reading it, but n you cannot physically actually like throw it away. Yeah. You'll, you'll keep packing them goddamn things around, but you'll never throw it away. And that's what's cool about this book to me is like, this is a book that's going to be useful to people. And in fact, I would argue actually is only going to become more and more useful over time, not less. I mean, a lot of, a lot of books that you see about certain things that you can learn from, they kind of age and, and some of those things kind of tend to become less relevant as technology moves on. But I would argue that this is one of the few books that actually will become more relevant, quite frankly, to maybe a scary level over the next generation or two or three generations with where we're headed as a country. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I educate people at Philcraft about they should have referenceable material. If the internet shuts down, how are they going to reference anything, instruction manuals, technical manuals? Um, all those things are very important. So have a library. I have a library. I have thousands of books. My most prized possession, physical possession, because my material world, could burn to the ground and I wouldn't care. I, I honestly don't. It's it, it's more of a burden than anything. Mine did. Yeah. 
And we literally, and it was one of the, I said today is one of the best things that ever happened to me. Absolutely. It, it's almost like a cleansing. Cause it was when you grow up poor, you, you hang on to things, right. Mm-hmm. And things mean more to you tangibly do. And I think books are very important and they've always been important in my life. My, my most prized possession material wise is a book that was written by Ernest Shackleton uh, called South right after the Shackleton expedition, the endurance mm-hmm. expedition. And he actually signed it. And there's a letter from him. No shit. In the book, yeah. Oh, my God. And so that book, for me, um, is in a safe, and it's something that I want to hand down. But same deal with knives and guns. I think there's only so many things that you could pass down that mean something to somebody. And I hope the information in this book is valuable to somebody out there. Oh, 100%. And I, I would actually... You know, it's interesting because, like, um, I'm I'm super excited. I haven't actually read it yet, but I mean, I just got it a couple of days ago from you. Thank you, thank you also for writing in it. It's really that's really cool. Um, but what I was going to say is, is you know, I, I feel like I'm a fairly capable person. If if all hit shit hit the fan, I'm fairly prepared. Um, it's so funny we're having this conversation, and this was not meant to be. But when we were waiting for you to get here, we were actually in the house discussing, and I was saying next year I'm talking about putting in a big generator and I was telling Andrew talking about putting in another thousand gallon propane tank next to the one I already have and linking those two together. Um, all of this stuff we were covering in the, in the kitchen just a couple hours ago. And, and I told him, you know, if an EMP, like actually being alignment and knowing the way of the electrical grid works and the way it's tied together and the way that things can cascade and become a problem, especially, and that can happen. And I was telling him a story about how it did happen where, it can happen by accident mm-hmm. in a small area and, and not a big deal. Shit gets put back together. But if it's coordinated and planned and someone knows what they're doing, uh, I mean, holy shit. It's, it could be an unbelievable event. And a lot of those transformers, those giant transformers and substations, those things are a year or two in production. I mean, they don't just keep, we don't keep those on the shelf at the yard. You know, you're not setting those transformers, not the ones that convert. 230,000 volts to 7,200, you know, or 500,000 volts to 7,200. So if, if the right coordinated plan happened, which means you lose power, which means you lose basically everything. You can't pump water anymore. You can't go to the bank and get your money out. You can't pump gas. Mm -hmm. This is all stuff we were discussing and we were discussing about what we would do and how we would use a generator if we had it. Like today in a lightning storm, power goes out. Yeah, we kick generator on. It's kind of a cool it would be a cool thing to have in that event. You would use your generator generator as little as possible to conserve mm-hmm. your fuel. Cause it might be a year. It could be two. Um, and a book like this, like I'm excited to read it. Cause I feel like I can really learn a lot of stuff, but I think what's even more important is we, a lot of us have family that live in big places that actually don't live the lifestyle we do. And they're actually wholly unprepared, frankly. And they have no idea. They, you know, go to Broadway plays at night and they work in an office and whatnot. And I think those are the people that actually you could do the biggest favor by buying this book and mailing it to them and say, just put it on your shelf, even if you don't read it. Because there might be a day, this is the only book that you need in the city you live in. Yeah, I think uh, we bought into the idea that outsourcing all these things is going to make our lives more efficient. It's why cities, you know, are capitalizing on attention and time doing the thing, working the job, but everything else, education, healthcare, security has been outsourced to, you know, support us, support our endeavor and capitalism. And, and that's a big benefit, but you lose something when you do that. You lose your independence, you leave your, lose your self-reliance, your ability to get back to basics. And then when the infrastructure is very dependent because it depends on all those people stacked on top of each other, when it fractures and fails, it's catastrophe. Yeah. And, you know, the estimates via government contracted survey, more of a study, determined that, you know, the power lines and the infrastructure, it only takes a dozen or so specific stations to mm-hmm. be targeted to shut down power for 18 months and beyond. And, and that's scary because people don't realize it. I mean, you realize it when you're in rural Montana and you have a storm And you pull up at a gas station to get gas because the next gas station is a couple hundred miles and you can't pump the gas because it's dependent on on electricity. And you go, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? Well, I'll just wait till the power goes on. Yeah, you're inconvenienced, but what does that look like in a deliberate attack? Like you said, 
And these things, you know, you behind the curtain as a lineman, me behind the curtain in special operations and counterterrorism and understand, understanding how things are exploited. When you, when you peek behind those curtains, it scares the hell out of you. Mm-hmm. And part of my motivation in just teaching people preparedness anyway is there's things I continue to do um, in education from things that I know that I can't even talk about. Where I'm right. like, dude, if you only knew how fragile we were, if you only sat in the Joint Terrorism Task Force briefs or, or the Global War on Terror briefs of all the players and all the things that are going on behind the scene that you don't have to deal with because you're living a first world existence, it would scare the hell out of you. And, you know, instead of being scared, be proactive, uh, be a person of action, implement some of these preventative measures so when it does hit the fan, you're not behind. Right. Yeah, and if you think about some kind of a major emergency, let's just say you actually have the ability to get in a vehicle and try to get out of the city that you're in, say Seattle, for example, or L.A., and you're like, I'm going to head to Montana. But you've got a quarter a tank of fuel in your car and you jump in and you do get to that first gas station. Maybe it's at Ellensburg, Washington or Soap Lake, Washington. That's now where you're going to be. Like that's, that's as far as you can travel. And that's now your new spot for as long as it takes to get that power on. And in an emergency, and it's weird because, you know, uh, especially growing up in that era that we both did around the year 2000, there was like the crazy prepper, crazy like when the millennium turns like... Y2K. Y2K. And I remember that in people freaking out and we thought it was hilarious. And I don't actually consider myself a crazy prepper, but there is a difference between being a prepper and being prepared. And I don't think really that there's ever been a time... And I shouldn't say that because I wasn't alive in the World War II era, the 40s and, you know... Vietnam and different times like that. But in my lifetime, there's never been a time I think that's been more important to be prepared. And I don't think there's a time that's been more precarious with what's happening in the world right now. I mean, if you look around with Ukraine and Russia and, you know, frankly, just our own government with the ineptness to protect ourselves, like I have no faith I mean, we, with what happened with Afghanistan and then everything else that we're doing. I have zero faith that we're actually doing the things that we need to do as a country to protect ourselves. And I saw as a lineman, we had a huge uh, windstorm here in August of probably 2014, 20, uh, yeah, 2014 probably. And it took out power to most of Missoula for about five days, a bunch of Missoula, big area, big transmission line just continued toppling up Miller Creek on homes in backyards on cars. And, Actually, it was this giant windstorm all the way down the Bitterroot, kind of where you came from today. Uh, we were one transmission line away from losing the entire valley, like in entirety. And what people don't realize about way, the way electricity works, and you got to think about, and I encourage people to think about where do you live and how close do you live to a substation? What's the first thing that we do as linemen is we report to that shop, And then it was actually interesting because we had lost all communications. All of our power grid of the entire state of Montana is controlled out of Butte, Montana. It's called SOC, Systems Operation Control Center. Um, They had zero communication or telemetry data coming in from any subs. All communication knocked out. And we went literally, our foreman told us, drive to every substation and write down on a piece of paper what you see hot, not hot, energized, whatever, drive back and report that and do not stop for anything unless there's a life-threatening situation happening. You see a pole tipped over or whatever, drive past it. It was that kind of an emergency. We then reported back and then it becomes, we have to get transmission lines in power first, right? Because that has to feed the substation. And then once you have substations hot, you then start working as close to the substation as possible and you work out from the substation. So if you live five miles from town or 10 or like we do 20, um, you quickly become way down the priority list and always, and as, as it should be a lineman asks themselves, how many houses can I turn on with my next move? And so you're looking at a map and you're like, I can pick up 400 homes here. I can pick up six here. Six are going to wait days. And literally the switch that we threw in, 
the 400 homes that turned on were right across the street. And these people don't understand why they're not getting picked up. So we had pockets in town where there's eight, 10 homes out of power for five days while their neighbors had power for four of them. And so, you know, what was fortunate for these people was this happened in August and not January, you know, and imagine how cold people would be in two days in January in most of our country, the Northern half. Crazy. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of mind boggling. And we had people with, you know, freezers of meat going bad. And I mean, it was a fucking shit show. Yeah, and that's just a couple of days. And this is a tiny place in Montana that, frankly, the rest of the country doesn't give a shit about. Put that in New York City, and 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 in, in a deliberate attack, because now you had panic. Nobody around here was panicked. It's summertime. This won't go to work. We'll hang out outside and barbecue, like have a campfire. But in a deliberate attack, I think about COVID. Look at how crazy people got at grocery stores and the gas lines and trying to buy toilet paper and shit for a bullshit flu virus. What happens in a deliberate EMP attack or something like a terrorist attack? Imagine the panic. Foreign adversaries know that too. They know our weakness. I mean, all these things that Jack Carr talks about in his book, Terminal List, and it's all predictive and it's all preventable. And we're making all the same mistakes. And, you know, the big problem is we're outsourcing all those things. The government is failing at their job. And we had this buy in and this agreement. The best thing that's happening is people are now having to wake up and realize, oh, well, maybe I should just get back to kind of what we did, you know, in life a couple decades ago, yeah. you know, and just get back to basics. And you could just listen to prepared or listen to the talk and go, man, I should probably do something. And that's a good start. Um, we always tell people like preparedness is not a hobby. It's more of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and you don't have to be the tinfoil hat guy to be a prepper because I think, I think there is a far right extreme of it. Yeah. Most certainly a lot of those people are paranoid. But you could introduce some of these tactics, some of these techniques, some of this advice into your life and not make it crazy. You can actually make it fun. You know, like rural Montanans, the power goes out and they're out barbecuing and doing fires. Well, how's that going to work for, out for you in a heavy populated city? And if you don't have a place to displace to, or you think you're going to displace to Montana, good luck with that because Montanans aren't going to want you here. Right. So you got to have a plan. And those basic skill sets is what we teach. And again, it's not a manual per se giving you all the data points and all the specifics of what you're supposed to do. It's planting the seed mm -hmm. because the journey begins with, man, okay, I have some now awareness that this is a problem. And then your journey, depending on where you live in the country, is on your own. We could provide the education and the resource for that, but it's important. I mean, like, uh, we talked about this before offline, but hunters. Yeah. How many hunters go out in the back country every year and just make gross mistakes that were very preventable that could have saved their life? Right. Because they didn't pack the fire starter. They didn't pack the right clothing. Mm -hmm. They were out past uh, dark or too late. And those things are preventable. And, yeah. You know, it, it, it could all be prevented just with a little bit of preparedness. Yeah, and and we don't have to talk about the worst extremes, um, you know, EMP attacks and shit from other nations, but just like you said, and, and it resonates with, you can actually have really a lot of fun with this. We, we lost power this spring a couple times. We had an issue going on with our power line serving our place, and what we realized, it was actually really good because I being a lineman, I like sat around for a little bit, and I'm like, Okay, power's not coming on. So I went and drove the line out, and I found the the door down on the cutout. And so I called the co power company. I was like, hey, here's where it's at and whatnot. Well, it was the, the lineman called me that's reporting to come fix this, but he was still like an hour and a half out. Well, what we realized was we had all these kerosene lanterns, and my kids had never even seen them. My wife literally decorates with them around the house. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, grab those lanterns. And so we get those, and we go to light them, and like – one of them's like stuck frozen because it's all gummed up and shitty. And we finally get, I get that one fixed and working. We light that lantern. And one of the other ones doesn't even have a wick in it. It's just a decoration. And so we lit two or three lanterns. We had two or three that didn't work. And my kids were just amazed about, and they thought it was so cool. Like we were like homesteader days and we had the <laughs> kerosene lanterns going and we have a gas and I purposely put a gas range 
in my in my house because I wanted to be able to cook without power. But I showed him we had to light the gas range, you know, with a striker. There was no electricity, you know, this kind of stuff. And we still cooked dinner and uh, barbecued with the gas grill. And we ate by lantern light. But I told my wife, hey, we need to order a bunch of wick material and just throw it in. We have a, a back storeroom back here where we have 150 pounds of beans and rice, flour. And it honestly takes up two tubs. It's like, who gives a shit? It was like $200 worth of stuff. But I have four kids I'm responsible for and a wife. And if that meant that we can get by for literally months off of that, if something happened, like, is that $200 really wasted? And I told my wife with the flour, don't go buy the giant bag. She went and bought a bunch of small sacks and she just takes out of those and refills the house just to keep things fresh. But, uh, I would tell people one of the things is have a bunch of fun with it and actually just shut your main breaker off to your house at three in the afternoon before the kids come home from school and leave it off until the next morning and see how you guys do. And you're going to realize how quick you run out of water in your house. And you're going to realize like, you know, that you can't cook and like you, you don't have any light and see how that works, you know, and see how, okay, now your batteries on your phones are dead. Do you have a backup battery, you know, battery pack or whatever. So to your point, and I know I'm over talking too much here, but like, I actually think this stuff is really fun. It can be a blast and such a learning experience with the kids to show them like, this is what can go wrong. And like, how should we mitigate that? And like, how, how can you just be able to be prepared to deal with it? Yeah. It's a beautiful process. I mean, like I talk about homesteading and people are like, well, I can't get chickens. I'm like, it's not about the chicken. It's about the process. If you start somewhere, never been hunting, get into hunting because it's not about the hunt. It's not about eating the specific meat. It's about the whole thing. It's about like the train up, the education, you know, doing the thing and then harvesting the meat, breaking the bread. It's the whole entire experience that's going to make you more resilient, which is by default going to make you more prepared. And I think like you said, you know, turning off the lights, that's really cool because, you know, when the lights go out, you get – back to basics and you start discovering who you are as a person and who you are are as a family. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people operate so much immersed in technology. They can't function without having that cell phone in their face. And that's bad. I I don't have an addictive personality. I never have. I grew up around addicts, but I just didn't have that genetic predisposition. And so I could put my phone down. And don't feel cracked out because I need to get back to it. I just have always had that. But many of the people I surround myself with have an addiction. Right. And that's a good way to wane yourself off an addiction is take deliberate time to just step away from it. And it's just going to make you better. Every lineman will tell you this, I bet you. But one of the coolest things about, you know, a thunderstorm that comes through and it knocks out some, say, some underground power. You have bad cable and it's going to be six hours to fix it, seven hours. We would pull into a neighborhood in July, night like tonight, we just had this big lightning storm. Cable goes bad. We pull into the neighborhood right now. It's getting towards dusk, but there's still like an hour of light left. And there's kids freaking everywhere. And they're playing in the street. They're riding their bikes. And literally, we talked about this all the time. And they would, they'd be out building ramps and jumping their bikes and you know, playing Cowboys and Indians, like literally like all the stuff, the neighborhood would be full. Every time we went on a bad underground in a neighborhood where kids lived, they were outside playing and they were having a ball. And the minute we would shove that cutout home and, and all of the porch lights came on and the street lights, it was like literally like cockroaches. Everyone right back in the house and it went quiet. It's sad. It was super sad. It was like, there were times where like, should we even should we even re-energize this right now or should we like go have dinner and then come back and re-energize it? Cause these kids are having a blast. Let them play. Yeah. And it really does show you. And I'll bet you if you're somebody that's frustrated with how much you talk to your teenager and they head to the basement and they watch TV, you shut your breaker off at three o'clock and they come home and you tell them you're out of power. I will bet you, you have the best evening discussing and talking and whatnot. Cause I guarantee you with those lanterns and those lights in your house, everyone will come together. They won't be down in their room in the dark by themselves. They'll be up around you. I'll bet you for six or eight hours until they go to bed 
and the lights are on the next morning, it'll be a great night. Yeah, you, uh, that's something that I, I think every family should implement. You know, I tell people, like, get outdoors, get somewhere where you're isolated, where you don't have the cell phone reception, but turning off your power in your, in your house is actually a good idea. It's simple, and the kids will never, I mean, they're not going to go check the breaker. It'd be a pretty yeah. smart kid. Yeah, that's some Lyman stuff right there. <laughs> yeah. That's what a Lyman would do. And it's super, so it's a 200 amp, the big the big breaker right on top shuts it all off, and you're just like, I don't know, power company's coming. I don't know when they're getting here. I love that. You know, That's awesome. Yeah, so it's uh, it's something that this this book really does. It resume, resonates with me, but I really think the best thing that people can do is buy it and give it to people. Um, if you really truly care about potentially somebody that you might not be there to help. My sister lives in downtown. Well, not downtown. She lives just north of Seattle, and uh, you know, she has a very capable husband. They're pretty capable people. Um. But there's a bunch of people out there that are, comp- and uh, quite honestly, they're very capable, but I'll guarantee you they haven't really thought through a lot of this stuff. And if they had a resource of like, okay, what can we do? It'd be a big one. We were talking uh, tonight about, I told my wife, I'm like, we need to buy a filter of some kind and just have it in a tub somewhere. Because like we have a pond with water right there. There's a river back there. If our pond's frozen in the winter, we can haul water. Um, but the only way really to drink it safely would be to boil it without a filter. But like I told Andrew, we'd be using our, we'd be using our propane, especially if you were out for literally months, you'd be using your gas. You would want to use your gas as little as possible, you know? So I actually have fun thinking about this shit. As you can tell, it kind of spins me up. Yeah. I I mean, I love it too. I think it's, it's one of the things that makes it an amazing journey is it, it always evolves. I mean, like homesteading, I suck at it. That's why I like it. Yeah. You know, I, I just lost four chickens and two ducks last week because of coyotes. And I'm like, oh, it would, there's a problem. How do we fix it? Well, you got to figure it out. You know, where's this? Kill that bastard. Where's this coyote coming in? You know, I need to get a flitter now for my gun. There's literally one laying in my field right now. Yeah. I mean, I mean <laughs> it, when, you, when you start to live a more ancestral and primal existence, getting back to some of these basics, it, it feels good. And um, like I'm doing a rewilding class and, People always ask me what the hell is rewilding, and most of the class is already sold out, and I tell people, like, I'm not going to tell you. I mean, I'll I'll give you the the basics, the principles, which is it's getting back to basics. Mm -hmm. And you're so full of dopamine because everything you want in the world is on a screen, and you are a crackhead for it, and I'm going to literally detach and cut the umbilical cord, and it's going to suck. But then you're going to come back to me a week later, maybe a day later and say, man, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And now you're going to understand and have the tools to be able to implement that deliberately in your life on your own. And that's important. We need to know the tactics to kind of, this is overwhelming us. We aren't living a good existence. None of our kids are talking to each other. We're at the dinner table on our phones. If you're at the dinner table at all. Right. And then you need to detach and deliberately take the time to build back those relationships. That's one of the problems with the, I think, I mean, we know this because every damn psychologist is telling us we are in a, a social media mental health dilemma. Mm-hmm. And it's because all of our attention's socially dysfunctional because we thought social media was going to bring us closer together and it, it ripped us further apart. Mm-hmm. And so there's more depressed, anxious, uh, and suicidal people than ever before in the history of our, our world. And that's scary. But again, nobody pays attention to it. Because if you look at a mass killing or a mass shooting or a man-made disaster, you immediately think it's the tool. That's the problem. No, it's it's the psychology right? and it's the current state of affairs and the mental health of our country. And again, this preparedness lifestyle brings you back to the roots of who you are, who you were, and that's a good thing. It's always a good thing. Yeah, it's... Uh the social media thing is an interesting thing because it, it can, it's, it's one of the best and most powerful tools that's changed my life because I, I built a company through it. So it can be a phenomenal tool, but from an emotional, uh, standpoint and a, and a psychology standpoint of our society, I would definitely agree. It's, it's been one of the worst things that that's happened to us. And when you, I grew up in a town that didn't have cell phone service until I went to college, you know, I was 19 or so when, when, Lincoln got a cell phone tower. And I remember growing up, there was a lot more just barbecues, like get togethers. 
people just got together. Um, there were more social functions that happened down at like some of the businesses in town. People would put different things together and the town would come down. The school was a big gathering spot, you know, sporting events and stuff like that. Cause that was a social sporting events is a great place in a small town to see the neighboring rancher or the guy that works at the office down the street. Um, those small town school atmospheres, football games, stuff like that were big gathering places. And I honestly think there was better attendance back there, back then at those kind of events. For sure. Yeah. Than there is today because now you'll fill two or three hours on a Friday night looking at your phone or watching TV when before you might have, right, oh, let's go down and watch the local football team, see how they're doing and see, and frankly, not even watch the game because you see 20 people you want to sit and be a bullshit with, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it was interesting. The last podcast I recorded, which we, we haven't even just released yet. It was just two days ago. Uh, I had an old guy in here, Jerome Winan. Uh, nobody's going to know him really. Um, when I, when I released the podcast and that's part of the reason I started my podcast is I wanted to interview the old masters that were pre internet and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Cause today knife makers, and really I would say in almost every industry, if if you're not some big presence on social media, then you don't exist and nothing existed before it. Well, Jerome's been making knives for 30 years. I think he started in 82 and he's 87 today and he works in his shop as hard as any knife maker I know today. He's a freaking savage and he literally drags his oxygen bottle around making knives and he did his whole podcast sitting here with oxygen on and he's talking about pulling the ram out of a forklift to try to redo his press because he wants to make a Damascus bowl and he's trying to figure out how to make a Damascus bowl. And he heard me talking, Andrew, uh, coming down for Andy Stumpf's. I called him on the phone. Was that an out amazing? Yeah, he's he's wonderful. He's also somebody that, like, the, the mind, like, he's always thinking and he's always ready to build something new. It's crazy. And that, that podcast is going to be dropping, but the point is, is he's 87, so... He's three years away from being nine. He was born 1935. And I asked, started the podcast asking him about when he was born, which was the middle of the depression, Dust Bowl days. Mm -hmm. And he was a teenager before they got a tractor for their farm. He did all horse drawn farming. And he talks about his dad sitting his lazy fat ass on the seat. Well, Jerome had to whip the horse and shit like that. And like, he talked about not having power until he was, I think, well into his teens um, and, and hauling water for baths from the, the windmill. And it, this conversation makes me think about Jerome and that in two generations, we went from being like the most capable, having the most capable people I would argue on the planet to being completely incapable in a lot of, a lot of segments of society. You know, and I was even sitting here asking him, I asked him on the podcast, uh, how they took care of their meat, like, cause they didn't have a freezer. And he's like, well, we rented a meat locker in town, but we rarely went to town cause they had to ride a horse to town. So you didn't run to town to get groceries. And he said, otherwise we canned it or made jerky, smoked it. And I was like, man, those are skills that are like gone, like in a, in a flash. It's amazing. And that, that kind of lifestyle, like I don't want to live it. Like I like my diesel truck and my air conditioned seats, <laughs> but I, I, it, it like trips my trigger. Cause I'm like, God, those guys were so capable. I would love to like learn more about it. Yeah. It doesn't take us long to get blasted back into that, that world though. Isn't I mean, that no shit. I mean, we saw it with natural disasters across the country, just small stuff. But I mean, look, I, I think people are resilient. I think people will figure it out eventually or they won't. I mean, we have in New, Buffalo, New York. We had, um, a young gal 20 in her twenties die in a city street in her car, six minutes from home, a mm-hmm. hundred feet from the front door of a house because she just held up and a couple of people froze to death, but she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. I mean, that's how it works when you're not even remotely prepared because you're so complacent. And I think a lot of our country is complacent right now and it's, it's a shame, but the bottom line is, you know, putting out the information, it's like you could pick it up or you could lay it down. Right. Now, we're providing the information. This isn't doom and gloom. The idea was to kind of talk broadly about statistical probability. This isn't zombie apocalypse stuff. Right. It's common sense, and it's very applicable. And like I said, I mean, Penguin Random House, 
um, who's my publisher, you know, they, they publish Michelle Obama. But they also publish Jordan Peterson. It's everything in between. This is not political because disaster is an equal opportunist. It All doesn't right. care who you are. And so you can pay attention or, or you cannot. You know, I it, think that's, but it does care if you're woke, right? Maybe. No? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, to, and to your point, like when I talk to my kids about all this stuff, we, I, and I think you do have to be careful to talk to your kids because I think there's a difference between raising scared, paranoid kids, especially sure. in a place where, um, frankly, a lot of people can be as prepared as possible and they're still dependent on things to work around. I mean, if you're in a big, big city, um, there's only so much preparedness you can have to where it gets bad enough where you're going to maybe potentially still have to depend on help. But I encourage people like we, we talk about it in a, in a, in a, like in a fun way and a what if and how this and that, but it never in a way that like scares them and never in a zombie apoc- apocalypse way. And um, I, I really think that people need to talk to their kids for sure and make it a fun, like problem solving question of like, what do you guys think we should do? What would you do? And give them little bits and pieces of it. Don't start off with you know, like, this giant problem that seems insurmountable and like, Nope, that won't work because of this. And it's like, no, make sure they understand that. Like, no, that's a good, that's a good idea. Like if we were out of power for a couple hours, that would work great. If we're out of, what, but what if we're out of power for a day or two and like start to teach them. And I, I do that stuff with my kids a lot just because I think it's, it's, we have fun with it. You know, it's not in a big scary way. Mm-hmm. Um, with your book, I did want to comment. It's pretty amazing. The names on the back of this thing, Evan Hafer, Chad Robichaux, is that am I saying that wrong? Robichaux, Robichaux, Robichaux. Mm-hmm. I didn't get it right both first times, but I am completely familiar with him. And then Tim Kennedy and Andy Stumpf, and then you have Jack Carr right in the forward. Like your book has five unbelievable names right on the front and back cover. What does that feel like? Just you have to get people smarter and more capable than you. I mean, Jack Carr right in my forward. You're going to be disappointed when you hear Ray Porter speak the forward so eloquently and then you get to me and I'm like to he to ha <laughs> and it's like oh god how did do you, you do your own reading I did yeah but how do you follow Jack Carr you know he wrote well that. you do have like, a pretty deep sexy voice well the voice is good but the words just suck compared to Jack Carr I mean <laughs> read the first sentence of Jack Carr's forward it's like the battle of Thermopylae and all this shit I'm like what the f-? I'm like I didn't put any of that sexy in there he's just he's I mean, he's a he's actually a, an author. You yeah, know? yeah. I, I I know this stuff because I I experienced a lot of it, but I think there's a difference. You know, I'm a I'm a technical writer, and when you have somebody as creative and as intelligent with um all his background and experience, Jack Carr. I mean, he could write this book and do just as well, if not better. And that's that's how I down selected it because Phil Craft is about subject matter experts having a conduit and having the ability to reach and engage with people who are interested in the subject matter. I'm not Phil Crass Rival. I'm not my company um, because I'm not an expert at everything. I, I select and down select the right people like Kevin Estella, mm-hmm. you know, an intelligent Bush Crass survivalist. Yeah. Knows who, more about knives than maybe anybody walking. Yeah. He's, he, he lives it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and when you have somebody like that on your team, um, they could pr- provide the education as the SME, as the subject matter expert. And I think that's the key to the book. It's a culmination of my experiences, but... You are me, guys, yeah. and your goddamn acronyms. Just yeah. can't help yourselves. Which one was it? What it is? What, I think you just said SME. SME. Yeah. Uh, SME. We call them SME. When, when, when we have veterans around here, I start talking about, like, BGAs and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and they're like, what's that? I'm like, oh, it's a blade grinding attachment. Yeah. Don't worry your about company it. Is an ac- your company is an acronym. It's yeah. behind your face. <laughs> MKC. <laughs> Mux. Yeah. I just start making acronyms up to make you guys feel like you don't know I'm what you're here. But every time I'm hanging around all you guys, I feel like a complete dumbass. <laughs> like, I don't know what they're talking about. They haven't said an actual <laughs> word that's in the dictionary in 12 minutes. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you, we have horrible vocabularies. Can't believe Andrew... Hasn't hired himself a friend yet here. Nope. Nope. We're staying uh, just me. In fact, it's, I think I'm the only veteran representative now at this point, but That's officially, true. you know, you're a veteran affiliated now with me here. So yeah. Important. Well, like, like Andy stumps a master bladesmith. Cause he knows me. Yeah. He's watched forged and fire. <laughs> so 
I'm pretty much a Green Beret because I have a few Green Beret <laughs> He's friends. He's the CEO of Black Rifle Coffee. I'm also a Navy SEAL, Green Beret and a Navy SEAL. <laughs> you could SEAL. be both of those. Yeah, I am. I identify hard. as both. Are you waist up SEAL or are you waist down Navy SEAL? What do you, th- what do you, what would you opt for? Who has the biggest weenie? Seals do not. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a Green Beret. <laughs> yeah, you're Green Beret. <laughs> green beanie from the waist down. <laughs> Oh my God. So when you, when you went to write this, cause I, I actually have no idea about this process. How, how, how does this process begin? And, and how, like, how long did it take you to work on this thing? It's a horrible process. It's difficult. It was difficult for me. Like I, I, one, it, it was a two year project. Okay. The hardest part was convincing a major publication, Penguin Random in this case, that the subject matter was important. And Lucky for me, I had. Uh, a did you war- shut their breaker off? I I did a lot of things behind closed doors <laughs> that I don't care to admit, but it was a campaign. I yeah. mean, I had to advocate for myself and my position, but luckily I had um, a person who believed in it. And her name was Helen, who believed in the mission, who believed in what we were doing, and the original couple takes of this were no go. We mm-hmm. weren't getting in the door, and then COVID nineteen happened. Oh, and when that happened, it was like, oh, all of a sudden, you know, Mike is crazy. Phil Craft is crazy. And then a week later, it's like, oh, man, those guys are really relevant. Actually, you're a terrorist, aren't you? Oh, domestically. Domestic. Yeah, I'm a CONUS terrorist. Domestic. That's not as dangerous. Okay. That's not as bad. Um, We'll get to that later. We'll get to that. And so the process of getting them to be on board was difficult. But once they were on board, they made it real easy for me, as easy as it could be for me. The problem is I'm not like Jack Carr. I don't have the ability to just write a book. I'm the CEO of a company, so I run the day-to-day. I also train for my own company every weekend. and It's really a side job. I mean, it's like a, it's an after hours before. I mean, it's like... It was a side job. Like when I started MKC, I was a lineman. It was, a, it was a, whatever hours you can find. That's what it was. That's a, yeah, I never, I never really thought about that. It's not like you have time to sit down for six of your eight hours of your day and just sit in your office and write your book. I mean, cause I, I see you're all over the place. Like you travel every day, you're everywhere every day. I mean, uh, my schedule for the next year by the minute is nearly dictated. And so that was the most difficult part. And, um, well, I have a bachelor's degree that took me 15 years in the army to get, cause I had a nickel and dime education in between operations and missions. Um, that book, luckily for me, I had help from a professional writer who's an editor. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I would record all the subject matter on the way to an event. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a 10 hour drive. It was 10 hours of recording. And then I would break that based on the, the chronological order of things into segments. He would transcribe that. I mean, it would be easier with chat GPT four now. I mean, it'd be really shit. Write a book in like 15 seconds, a couple years too early. Yeah. Yeah. So he would transcribe it. You Come, actually stole my next question. I was going to ask you if you just actually wrote it from Chat GPT. The next write book, me a book about the being next prepared. book is literally going to be Chat GPT. <laughs> um, but as I got it, I had to edit it and then make sense of it, and then putting all that together was the most difficult thing because once it's all together, you're you're diving in a book one page, nearly one paragraph, even one sentence at a time to get an understanding of the collective, and if it makes sense to the reader you have to read it and you have to listen to it and you have to do that thing. And that took a long time. So it's all information that was very easy for me to write because it's from my experience. But as soon as it all got out, it was very difficult to kind of refine the final project. Yeah. Organizing it and getting it to flow in the way that you want. And also making sure you're not, I mean, you're so in depth on a lot of this stuff that it would actually be hard to sometimes not just forget an obvious thing. And not put it in, and then maybe someone else is reading it, and they're like, well, what about this? And it's like, well, shit, I never, yeah, I, I just completely didn't even, it be, it's kind of like when I teach brand, brand new knife makers a little bit on a basic knife, it's easy sometimes to just forget that, like, a most simple step. Yeah. Um, so, especially, I think, uh, with something like this, because it's so, it's so involved, and you're trying to cover so many topics, it would be easy to kind of miss something and then have to go back. And I'm sure there's a lot of going back and rereading and rewriting. And Well, the biggest thing for me was, the, the easiest thing for me was 
everything that I broke it down into was what I teach at Fieldcraft. And that was a lot of distilling. Because if you say, hey, you're going to start a preparedness company, good luck with that. Yeah. Right? Because you can go every which way. And there's companies in preparedness that focus on 25-year shelf life food. Mm -hmm. They focus on the tactical gunfighting. Uh, what I realized is in the totality of all the things, it's the principles, it's the pillars, it's the fundamentals that matter the most. Because I, I'm not going to sit here and talk about the firearm because the statistical probability specifically is a nuance compared to the principle and the understanding of the fundamental. So if you understood the fundamental, you could go on that journey and figure out what's your best EDC consideration, et cetera. I just needed to come up with the pillars. So that's well, how and I, I, and I was looking through this, and I think you actually led, like the first chapter you led was about uh, the mental, the, your nervous system, and then the mental mindset. Yeah. Like the mental part of it then prepares you for everything about to come with everything throughout the rest of the book and how you think about things um, and setting yourself up for success. Yeah, most people want to hear about the cool guy stuff. Right. And, it, it, like, and that's the breakdown, like whether it's Army Rangers or – special operations period, I think a lot of people make the mistake of identifying guys with my background as being, oh, you're good because you can gunfight. It's like, no, 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 no. Like gunfighting is 1% of the overall objective. Mm -hmm. The most important elements of it are the planning considerations, the attention to detail, the contingencies, the physical fitness, the mindset and resilience you build through training all these protocols that we build and adapt for the gunfight. That's why we're successful. So if, if you kind of take that back, the disaster is the 1%. Right. What are you doing 99% of the time? It's not shooting paper and steel on a flat range. Right. It's all the things that are collectively going to make you more successful and likely probably uh, surviving in that 1%. Sure. And so that's a, a tough debate. The best thing I think is, um, for a new person who has never understood what preparedness is as a baseline to open up the first chapter and say the resilient mindset and go, what? Wait a minute. I thought I, thought I was going to be reading about generators and right. EDC pistols, and he's talking about mindset? Huh. Right. And then he reads it. It's like, oh, I, I feel like I'm setting that person up for success. Right. So I've, I've actually had messages with – and we've shared content and stuff back and forth about like, hey, what is Fieldcraft Survival? What do you guys do? Talk to me a little bit about, well, one, how, what, what year did you start Fieldcraft? Um, technically 2015, when I was a CIA contractor in Pakistan is when I officially, I got the logo, I got the business registered in 2015 in Pakistan. What was going through your mind at that moment? I mean, I imagine you were getting ready to retire trying to kind of think about what you wanted to do and how you wanted to transition. What, what was that? What was the plan with Fieldcraft at that, at that time? And has, how has that like evolved over time? Really? It's always been what it has been. I mean, here's what I, here's what I opted. Like one of the, I tell people this, like I wanted to open a, bre a brewery because I really like beer. I like the story and history behind beer. Um, after a few beers that night, I realized I like just drinking beer. I don't, I'm not like into this whole <laughs> yeah. like beer business. And tactical instructor, you, you throw a, a five by six case and you hit a tactical instructor out of my community. I didn't want to do that. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it actually is the most least interesting thing to me and the totality of my experience. Why? Well, I was an infantryman. I was a 18 Bravo a weapon specialist and I lived a profession by the gun. Mm -hmm. You know what impresses me more than uh, AR-15s? Uh, cowboy guns from the 1800s. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's just not anything that I wanted to be. And so I said survival was what I want to teach. Because the most interesting courses I've been, I've been to every survival school, by the way. Um, and, and legitimately. Um, I went to JSOX, Peacetime Detention, um, CRC, um, Covert Communications, e every single one, including the CIA's survival school. And I got the most out of those experiences because they were applicable in every environment that I was operating in. Because you have a sovereign country, they have a coup, and things fall apart. You need to have that information, right? So I thought it was very applicable. And even CRC, which is a, a wartime CIR school, high risk, I took something away from that that could apply to my everyday life. 
Right. And so for me, I was like, survival is the genre, except starting a business behind such a broad genre is very difficult, mm -hmm. right? And so I had to distill certain things down to make revenue. And that was, I needed to do tactical training because yeah. it was popular. Um, it's still by far the most popular training that we do. Um, but then I started developing products, you know, soft goods for mobility and developing all these things. And it became um, more of the revenue share of, of all the things that we were doing. So I knew it was survival. I didn't know specifically how it was going to go. And people ask me all the time, well, you're like this company. I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, it's like you're comparing a company that in 2015 was pioneering a space where I went into social media, had never had social media my entire military career or CIA career, and decided I'm going to start my first account. And that was in 2015. And posted with no understanding of how this thing works and did it day by day for eight years in a row. How are you so successful then? It's like, well, I could do what you do. It's like, do what I do. Yeah. But that took me eight years of something that I continue to do today every single day. It's, it's funny you say that about social media because when I started my account and started like angling towards launching Montana Knife Company, you talk about not knowing how to use it. I purposely made my account private. And then I was, you know, and then it was like, it took me like a year and a half to realize like, oh, you can't get in reach. I, 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 yeah, I need people to be able to follow me and see what I'm doing. I'm posting to basically like 12 friends here. Same. Like, why am I not getting more followers? Same. Because they can't see your shit, stupid. Yeah, same. <laughs> I learned so many habits that I was doing the wrong way, but I didn't know. And I think, you know, when I was developing this idea and pioneering the space of preparedness, everybody around me told me it wasn't going to work. And we had competition. I mean, today, there are more preparedness companies than I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. But every single one of those companies look at me as competition. Mm -hmm. The big difference is I've never looked at anybody as competition. I grew up in a community that would outsource the expert and bring them in from all walks of life. Not just the Rob, Rob Latham, you know, the professional shooter, but we were bringing in, um, <laughs> you talk about being a lineman. I brought in helicopter pilots that were linemen, yep. uh, pilots yep. that were used to doing that kind of thing. And I would bring them in and do helicopter training with them and photography reconnaissance training on that helicopter to take shots because they understood how to hover and get stable shots for reconnaissance. We were doing things like that. And when I look at my business, I go, dude, the consumer, the person wants all the options. They don't want one knife. They want every knife. Right. They don't want one EDC pistol. They want every EDC pistol. That's what happens when people like apologize to me when I'm out somewhere and they're like, oh, sorry, I got this bench made in my pocket or whatever. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Like, you know, it, it, I, I grew up, I, I was raised by knife makers. Like the only reason I got as good as I did in knife making, and I say this all the time, is because knife makers taught me and actually like took me under their wing. And I don't, like, you're a knife collector. Buy all kinds of knives. I just hope you buy some of ours too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that 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 mindset, that mentality of of trying to close. I just did a, again, this isn't out yet, but we I just did an SEO blog article thing today and I, listed the top like 11 knives uh, in my mind that aren't MKC knives made by American, um, strictly American manufactured knife companies. And it's going on our website. And I'm literally suggesting knives of other knife companies. Like that, that whole idea to me of keeping people out, I would rather, and I think same with your company, be a resource that people can look to that's trusted. Yeah. Because the minute that you're, you're calling bullshit and you're like hiding, like we don't make a folding knife. So if somebody DMs me and says, where should I get a folding knife? What am I supposed to say? Like, well, there's no folding knife companies out there. Like just wait two years for ours. Right. Like I'll tell them like, this guy makes a good folding knife. This company makes a good one. Like Benchmade makes a great folding knife, you know? Um, That's a, it's a, it's a scarcity mindset and it's normal human behavior. Mm -hmm. I think people, do not realize, and I hope people who are listening to this who have that potential mindset kind of open their mind to it, a scarcity mindset is normal human behavior. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, you're forgetting the benefits of interoperating. I learned that from the military, from my community, because the best missions, the best operations, the best people that I've ever worked with had that mindset to develop uh, interagency relationships and cooperate. That right. was actually really on the news. I mean, 
some of the times that our militaries probably failed at the the worst was when some of those three letter agencies were purposely not working together and not sharing yeah. information. The Iran hostage uh, circumstance, mm-hmm. Desert One, started Joint Special Operations Command and Task Force One Sixtieth because a C one thirty refueling plan ran into uh, a payload helicopter, and that because of the lack of coordination and the lack of understanding, developed this joint idea and cooperation. I have that mentality and mindset. And so I, I constantly market people that I believe in because they're the right people. They're people of character. I, you know, it, like it, even we've had this conversation over knives. Like I recommend your knife as the number one uh, fixed blade, mm-hmm. especially for hunters, especially for utility. And then people have asked me, well, what's the folding blade? And like, well, I like several. You yeah. know, I have the Strider. I have the Benchmade. Right. Um, I sent you stuff when I, I went and spoke uh, at the sales team at Benchmade yep. and told you about that. And it's because, like, you get it. And I talked about Montana Knives in that conversation with them because they were talking about marketing. And I'm like, listen, you guys need to get organic and start communicating better because there's other companies that are going to crush you. Yep. You know who's crushing you? Montana Knife Company. And they're like, oh, I know. They are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> We're coming for you, bitch me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're next. No, it's it's true, and and we have talked about that. And you guys have actually been uh, really one of the leaders of of being that conduit of 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 sharing and doing things with other brands and bringing other brands in, and then uh, you know co opting each off of off of each other's uh, you know customer base and followers. Because a lot of our followers also believe and subscribe in a lot of the information that you're teaching, and a lot of the beliefs that you have. Those same people believe in you know, veteran issues and drink black rifle, black rifle coffee because of that. Yeah. You know, they follow, you know, Seekins precision and buy guns from those guys. Cause it's American made and it's weather. And they buy Nosler bullets because they're American made, you know, and there's all these different companies, but a lot of us, it's the same customers going around because they're, and, and there's a bunch of companies out there. You can name a hundred more gun companies, more ammo companies, you know, optics, um, but a lot of our people, I actually really think when you asked me earlier on your uh, blog, vlog thing you were doing um, about like how we grew so fast. And I really think it's because so many of our people learned about us from people in that network that that we had like beliefs and like values. Well, it was it was front ran by your being in the position in place to shake hands and look people in the eye. Yep. And when I first met you at Black Rifle Coffee in the mm. HQ, I was just like, who's this dude? And I, I get all this all the time, right? It's like, right. hey, my name is blah, blah, blah. And then I saw you again. And then I heard Andy talk about you. And then, and then Evan talked about you. And then Joe Rogan's talking about you. And I'm like, oh, that he gets it, right? Yep. And very few people get that. Like, you want something? Most of all the successful business decision, decisions or evolutions and progressions that I've had had to do with in-person, interpersonal meetings, like real-life stuff the social media might have started and kick-started it, but breaking bread, building relationships over handshakes, and that's how we grew. And again, that that's the part. We use social media as a tool to grow in a broad way, but you're right. There is nothing. I, I don't know how many places I drove to purposely and maybe even said, like, oh, I'm on vacation to not look like too much of a douchebag. But no, I drove there to meet and shake so-and-so's hand knowing that walking away, probably nothing's going to happen from that direct meeting. Like who, who meets somebody for the first time and then tomorrow like jumps into business with them, but they do, they start to, they start to see your name and your face around and they start to realize like, Oh, okay. And they start to watch your stuff. And then pretty soon, maybe that next meeting or two or three meetings down the road, you start to do something together. I mean, same way I met Dudley at, at the first tack, I just walked up to his booth. We chatted a little bit, gave him a knife with no expectations, no, I need you to post three times or do any of this shit. Like, here you go. And we gave away a ton of knives that way. And that's one thing I tell small business people that are trying to start your business. If you believe in your product, you got to give a lot of it away with no expectation or ask attached to it, you know? And, uh, you know, to me, that's the social media has made, made marketing great and easy, but it's also, I think, really hindered people because they forget that the actual most important part is the handshake and the eye contact. Yeah. Same, we, we do the same thing of giving it away through education and content, yes. right? Um, I, I've been doing podcasts for since I started the company. 
before I even knew how to podcast. I was talking in the speakerphone of my cell phone and then uploading as an audio file. And, and people were like, dude, your, your content's awesome, but you need speakers. I had customers sending me equipment to say, I love your stuff so much, I just want to, to see you succeed. People get it because that's the real, that's the organic, and that's what separates our businesses from businesses somehow, some way that lose themselves. And I call them soulless businesses. Mm -hmm. It's businesses that don't have a front runner, don't have an origin story, and people don't know who they are. And then I heard this morning on um, Morning Wire, which I listen to every single day, and they were talking about Nike and how Nike is now doing all these ads, all these woke ads. They've always been kind of that way, but they're promoting a doctor who does surgeries on children as a front runner for the movement. And I'm like, remember when Nike was just a basketball shoe? Yeah. Right? And now all of a sudden they're getting into identity politics and they don't know who they are. And I think that's the fringe, but that's also the natural progression when you forget where you come from. And, and I think um, a lot of companies that we interoperate with, including your company, will never forget where we come from. No. And, and I expect you, just like you expect me, hey, keep me in line. You see me slipping, mm -hmm. let me know. Yeah, and, you know, back to Nike, you know, that, that, quite honestly, I think back to when I was a kid, Nike was inspirational and, like, aspirational. I mean, uh, it was like, you know, I believe I can fly. Yeah, just do it. Just do it. Yeah. I believe I can fly. Pump that shoe up and you can fly like Mike. Like, it was, it was you know, inspirational to a young kid. Like, you too, you... Short, fat, little white bastard from Lincoln, Montana can jump just like Mike, yeah. you know, and it, it, but it made people better, made you work out, it made you believe in something and, and like strive for something. And, and now it's just, it's just a freaking dumpster fire. And it's like almost a, a, a tearing down of, of our country instead of a building up and an inspiration, you know, it's, uh, they actually have so many amazing athletes and stories that they could be so in unbelievably inspirational because so many of those athletes that have, that have done amazing things came from terrible situations. Yeah. But you it's know. also given, you know, all these companies that do this, like when you talk about the targets and the Bud Lights and it's, it's given opportunity for a lot of companies who still retain their values. Yeah. And I think that's the important element because consumers have never been more educated before in the history of consuming. And that's important because, you know, America is the biggest consumer of everything. And when we look at our position and place in the world, now we can make sound decisions. Now well, we can be smart consumers. And, and that is where Instagram and, you know, social media and connectivity has been an advantage is now you can get information in a second and you can react and you can let your, your voices be known in a second. Look at Bud Light stock. Yeah. Like in a month... Yeah. based on just how fast word traveled. And that wouldn't have happened 50 years ago. I mean, you'd have had to have read, read about it in some newspaper somewhere. Um, things can be very reactionary, and the public can actually let the board know exactly how they do feel about a situation. Yeah, And quite frankly, I felt that way about, about hunting knives and knife companies in general um, before I ever started this. And it's why I knew we could grow a company is – so many knife companies make hunting knives and they call themselves, you know, they, they don't call themselves hunting knife companies, but they make hunting knives and they promote hunting knives all the way up until there's a dead animal on the ground. And then they're a hiking company. They don't show an elk laying on the ground or a dead deer or a dead bear. Like they don't show the actual result of the hunt. And, and I think there's a respectful way for sure that we as hunters should show those pictures, you know, and there's a way to do the quote unquote grip and grin in a respectful way to the animal and also just to fellow hunters. Cause if you do it in a non-respectful way, in a shitty way, it just makes all of our lives harder to try to keep hunting and access and, you know, all, all you know, keep that pastime. But I felt like there was a door being left wide open for us to run through, frankly, as a brand. Yeah. And we can be like, we're a hunting knife company. Look, we hunt, and here's the result of it. Yeah. You guys are standing out for sure in that way because I can't think of one knife company that's communicating to the consumer like the way you are. Right. And, and that's important. I mean, that for me was the reason why I was like, 
well, let me let me try this out. Mm-hmm. And then when I got that knife in my hand and a podcast to do, and I understood for the first time some education behind a knife, mm-hmm. I had a resource now. Because, I, right. you know, my favorite thing about my position is looking and finding the expert that I trust to allow people to go, hey, this is the guy you need to listen to that's going to provide you the education and the equipment to get you outfitted. Right. And, and I think that's what we've become very good at. And it's my favorite part of the business. And, and we need that. We, we need, we need consultants. And, and that's something I'm proud of with our company and, and your company is the same way. You know, you were, you were eating or you were dishing out a lot of humble pie there and talking about how you have all these smart people to work for you. But ultimately at Fieldcraft, the leader of that company, the guy who started it is incredibly capable in most, if not all of the areas that you guys teach in. And if, if you're not the best at some of those areas, you're, you're, you're damn good at them. And you know, the same thing with our company, like, uh, you know, ultimately I can actually do the thing. I can make the knife. I can heat treat the blade. I can forge it. Um, you know, I'd be happy to show up to anywhere with any other CEO of any other major knife brand and demonstrate and talk and actually, but not just talk, but actually do the work and show, you know, and that would never happen because most of these CEOs aren't actually knife makers at all and could not sharpen your knife on a, sh- on a stone, you know, and that's, and that's, um, you know, we, we were up at Andy's last week on Friday and did a, a knife sharpening deal and, you know, people walk up and we said, bring whatever you got, any knife company will sharpen it. Um, and because one, we want to provide a service. We want to show people that, you know, a lot of those people have struggled to, ne- they could, their knife showed up brand new, not even sharp, and it's never been sharp, or they lost the edge, they can't get it back. We want to help you with what you have. And then we also want to teach you how to do it on your own. And then if maybe you can't do it with your blade, maybe it's actually not, and this is what I tell people a lot of times, maybe it's not actually your fault. Maybe it's the knife you're trying to sharpen. Maybe it wasn't made in a way that gives you any chance of sharpening that ever. Mm. It's thick. It's hard. Terrible edge geometry. You're never getting that thing sharp on that stone, you Mm. know. Um, But it also lends a lot of credibility to what we're doing because a guy handed me a Blackfoot that he had said had been through three deer. And it was definitely, you know, lost its edge. But he was super happy with it. But it it needed sharpened. And I took three passes on each side of that knife. And I just shaved, shaved hair off my arm in front of everybody. And that like nothing is more of a, of a statement of like, there's a customer saying he did this and then people watch me sharpen it. Like that's those, those events are a way to show that like our product one will stand behind it. Cause I tell people too, if you can't get them sharp, send them to us, we'll do it. Mm. And the way that you guys teach, um, for example, with the, uh, like with on the medical side, one of the most powerful things that I saw was somebody to give a tourniquet class and talk about a tourniquet, how to use one. I'm not a veteran. I've never gone through EMT stuff. I've never, you know, we did some bullshit first aid at work. Nobody ever, as alignment on all the skinning knives we have, we use knives all day, skin and wire, dull ass things. You're pulling towards yourself when you're skinning wire. The chance of cutting yourself is enormous or your bucket friend, bucket buddy. And I saw a tourniquet class done. And then they said, for 30 bucks or 35 bucks, whatever a tourniquet costs, that could save your child's life. And you now know how to use it. And it's like, why is there not one of those in every one of, of your vehicles? You know, and you get in an accident with your kid on your way to, to town to go to Costco and your kid gets, you know, their arm cut in a terrible way and you sit there and watch your kid bleed out because you don't have a $30 tourniquet. Mm. I mean, it's like two drinks at the freaking bar these days. Um, or that ability to stop and hand that tourniquet to somebody else in an accident that's that you've come up on a scene like that to me was life changing. We have a tourniquet in every freaking vehicle now, and those your field craft kits and 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 that that not just the kits and the product but the training is I I I'd be really curious to know how many lives you guys have saved that you don't even know about. Yeah, we get the feedback and it's a lot of traffic comes through about the kit, the position, the education, whatever it is. Um, the training side of business isn't a great scale. It doesn't progressively scale. I mean, there's not really any cases besides Blackwater, which Eric Prince already had capital when he started that. And, uh, it's debatable on how much profit he made um, after it was all said and done because there's a lot of liability. 
So training and education is very difficult to grow as a business. Yeah. But when you include the product and the education, that's responsible business practice, right? Like a lot of companies sell crap and you can go to any Walmart aisle, any Bass Bro Cabela's aisle and buy the crap with no idea how it works. And that's, that, that's what I, I learned from you guys. I mean, I, I would have just thought a tourniquet's a tourniquet. Yeah. I would have had no idea. And here you go to crank that thing down to save somebody's life and it breaks. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling to me that it's even legal to sell something that's not of standard of quality. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same argument with guns, right? Like you can go in and buy a gun, but you're not required to get education. That onus is on you. Yeah. And the unfortunate thing in first aid equipment, especially is um, a lot of the equipment is novelty. It's not real. I mean, here, a fire starter, here's the, here's the less risque version of it. A fire starter, uh, which is a ferro rod of magnesium, is a novelty item. Because the little ferro rod that you got from whatever company, name the company, from Walmart especially, um, is pennies. It costs pennies. But it will not save your life when you fall into a river in the backcountry of Montana and you have a short period of time to get that fire started to prevent hypothermia in the backcountry. And those little pieces of equipment are problematic, which is why we are trying to address those solutions with things that work. But in the experience, you know, my personal professional experience, I've experienced what happens when you don't have the right equipment and you don't have the right training. I mean, I've applied tourniquets. I've applied tourniquets to people in combat and had them break on me. Um, I've been in positions where I didn't have the tourniquet and I had people die on me. And so when you learn those lessons in blood, in combat, um, it becomes more real and you become mm -hmm. more purpose driven. Mm -hmm. And so that stuff's serious for me. Like I, I, my mobility bag, I talk about it all the time. It's like that derived from an experience where my team sergeant literally died on my, died in my arms uh, with his, his wife passed away in the same accident when I was driving behind them and they were driving their Harley mm. and happened in Fayetteville, North Carolina. It didn't happen on the battlefield of Iraq or Afghanistan. And so I don't want people to experience that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's preventable. And the reality is across the board, every major bad statistic, because of mostly the policies that exist in our country, bad leadership, um, there's a lot of people dying. And there's a lot of things that are wrong with this country. And it's more time uh, for you to train and get prepared for things that are going to continue to happen in our country. I mean, I think 2024, by far, will be the most controversial and likely deadly year our nation has ever faced in the history of our country. And specifically 2024, because the propaganda, the AI, the foreign adversaries, all the things during a presidential run... Um, it's going to potentially destroy our country and we'll either sink or swim. Mm -hmm. And that outside of your control, some of that, most of that is outside of your control. What is inside of your control is how you take care of yourself and your family. And that by benefit is going to take care of your community. You, you better get your shit together now. Yeah. hundred percent. What, what of the products that you guys have, what do you suggest the average person just has in their car commuting back and forth from Frenchtown to Missoula, 15 miles on the interstate, <clears throat> you know, there's lots of help around. You're not going to be stuck out there and necessarily um, be without help. But um, you also might find yourself then on a Friday night headed to Libby two hours from home on a dark road where maybe somebody doesn't come along for, for an hour or two. Like what, what, what things do you guys suggest people carry? Yeah, it's pretty easy for us. It's the staples of survival are important. So survival is fundamentally one of the most important things you can carry. Same with first aid. Um, I would put that in a mobility pack behind your seat panel. Um, our mobility bags have the ability to convert into backpacks so you could displace potentially from the bad situation and carry the stuff on your back, which I think is important. It's something I learned in the military. Like, have the stuff, but have the ability to break contact and get off the X with the stuff. And also, I think you know, outside the first aid kit, the tourniquet and the survival stuff that you should have on hand, you should have ready access to that stuff. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by ready access, it's like the idea of having uh, an EDC pistol in the waistband underneath your seatbelt, underneath your clothing concealed. Right. What good is that going to do when you uh, need it to immediately respond or react to somebody who's a potential imminent or immediate threat? 
And so when like, you like one of your guys said, a, a a tourniquet and a med kit or a med bag, mobility bag in the trunk of your car while you're pinned in your car does you no good. It does you no good. Yeah. And and a lot of people forget because we often think about these things and train in the best case scenario. You know, my favorite is like tourniquet application when somebody puts it around their leg and they're standing and they stand and they lift their leg and they loop it around their leg and roll it up. And I'm like, do you think that's how you're going to apply it? Like, no, you're going to be in the worst pain of your life. You're going to be crumpled in the fetal position and you're going to be upside down hanging from your seatbelt if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you think that way, the way you position your gear and equipment will change. So ready access is important and survival just quickly. I think the fundamentals um, especially with Montana, is the lack of shelter or fire or heat exposure to the elements is going to kick you, kill you quickest. It's, it's proven in backcountry survival. So if you have the ability to shelter, your vehicle could be the shelter. Mm-hmm. Shelter could be the shelter. And you don't have the ability to start a fire potentially, you could die of hypothermia. Buffalo, New York, 20-plus people died of hypothermia in an urban environment, an urban sprawl. So having that, having the ability to start a fire, having the ability to procure, um, like you said, filtrate and also uh, sanitize water is important. Um, but having the ability to use that vehicle to break contact, mm-hmm. to get off the X, to displace from the bad to the good is important. And that includes thinking about fuel considerations, thinking about tires and maintenance i mean how many people now because they outsourced everything to AAA, will sit on the side of the highway for an indefinite period of time rather than taking the 10 to 15 minutes to change their tire on the side of a strange highway in the middle of the night will just be a victim and i think right understanding all of that in this totality which we cover in the mobility section of the tangible pillar of preparedness um is important mm-hmm. no it's it's incredibly important. And we, like I say, I grew up without cell phone coverage. So some of these things were just things you just did. You know, we, in a small town in, in Montana, we always went for groceries in Helena, Great Falls or Missoula. They were always 50 to 80 miles away. Yeah. And <clears throat> every fall, my folks were like, all right, we got to get a, uh, you know, a sleeping bag or two in the trunk. Um, you know, uh, we had a lot of times winter boots, like an extra pair of winter boots, winter gloves, hat. Um, both of my daughter's cars have it. It's like, I demand it. Like you have to have that stuff in your, in your car, even for a teenager, it might be a sleeping bag where as, as much as you want to think that maybe your kids are never going to drink or do anything stupid, <clears throat> it might give them the ability to pull out the sleeping bag and stay somewhere instead of drive home. You know, and that's the kind of shit that I don't think people necessarily think about. You think about like, oh, Mikey's, you know, crazy prepper guy and worried about, you know, the Martians coming. It's like, no, there's actually super uh, easy situations to imagine that you can see yourself or your child getting into where um, having a car accident and you're sitting there in a prom dress and you don't have a great coat and whatnot, but you have a sleeping bag to crawl in um, to wait for paramedics to come while you're cold in the winter and your car's not running because you've wrecked it, you know. Um, there's wrecks all up and down these highways all winter long, you know, and I, and I, you see it all the time, these guardrails all bashed up and people gone off over the edge and how many people go by before somebody's, you know, starts missing somebody or before they notice and literally to just be able to crawl in a bag or put a tourniquet on, um, stop a bleed, stuff like that. It's, um, yeah, I, I think it's just so incredibly, um, you know, it, it's uh it's relevant to where especially where we live i guess it's why i'm so adamant about it you know i don't live in a huge city but i think where you live definitely dictates how you prepare and what situations you prepare for you know but well uh what else what do you got so you're you're heading from here you're going up to andy's right Mm -hmm. teaching up at andy's up at black rifle coffee kalispell yep um um andy's andy's wife was telling me about the last class that she took with that you guys do. And I want you to talk a little bit about it because, uh, Leah is a black belt in jujitsu and she can hold down pretty much any grown ass man you can find in and make him completely immobile. And she bought a mini speed goat up there. Well, she tried to buy it, but she got a mini speed goat up there and she wanted to carry a mini speed goat 
knife inside her her uh, waistband and whatnot because your class was so op- mind mind blowing to her. You guys kind of did a like shoot no shoot go no go situation class where you have you know and I'll let you explain it. But some she was she was talking like it was amazing how good you guys did at making it scary. You can turn the AC actually on in here. It's kind of sw- we're both starting to sweat. These lights and all this shit starts I'm to warm it up. Sweating bullets. Yeah, hit the mode right under the seventy eight. I'm glad Go I'm hydrated cool. with this Bud Light though. This Bud Light is great for hydration. Get him another Coors Light. I'll take a. <laughs> also, because uh, I've never I never got to boss an Army Ranger around like this. Get me a. Uh, you have to say Ranger. Ranger. What's yeah? Ranger is last name. Is that what you're, Ranger? Uh, Ranger Rick. Grab me a. <laughs> <laughs> A big truck beer. Yeah. I'll just do a, a Pellegrino or a water thing in Majiggy. Um, anyway, uh, she was talking about how, uh, thanks, brother. Actually, scary. You guys were able to make it in a in a quote unquote fake situation, and she's like, it was so intense. And she said she realized she said half the class was just shooting everybody they saw. Like, and now you have to defend in court why you why you shot and killed this person. And then at times, other people like herself, who's actually super capable didn't maybe pull her gun and shoot at the right time. And she said, as capable as capable as she is, she's like, it was an incredibly hard decision. Yeah, we we talk about it in the Pillars of Preparedness as decision point. I think um, the most eye-opening thing I've ever realized as training Americans throughout the country. I mean, last year, my company trained 10,000 civilians throughout Damn. the country. We train SWAT teams, law enforcement, military and civilians. And I grew up essentially on a flat range. I mean, that's how you train. The first time you do scenario-based training, sim hits, um, UTM, you start realizing there's something missing. This, this isn't like what we are used to doing. And I'll give you an example. Like in CQB, you learn, you go into your point of domination, depending on what type of CQB you do, but let's say you go into a corner of a room with your gun, you see a target. And the target is erect, typically standing, staring at you. And you have different ways that you assess the threat. Typically, it's hands demeanor. It's hard to identify demeanor on a paper target. So you look for hands, you see a gun, you raise your gun, you find the EOTech red dot, and then you break shots on the target. That process is isolated, very trainable, but not very conducive or correlated to reality. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is because we forget about behavioral factors. We we forget about movement. We forget about reaction. We forget about time. And so we started doing a course called personal security. I I made that course up with Amber. Um, She's the director of family preparedness. And Amber said, Hey, we need to do training for women. I said, I agree. But we have to break this down. And I, 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 wrote, I drew a line. And, I, and at one point, I said, this is where you learn tactical skill sets, like all the gun handling skills that you do. Except that's a technical training methodology, right? Yeah. It's, it's activating a script of action or behavior or training methodology that you practice. And that's like brushing your teeth, right? Except what was missing was the cognition, the decision-making. Because now you got to brush your teeth And do an obstacle course. Oh, so now we have to think through problems and brush our teeth? Yeah, that's what combat is. Right. But if you look on Instagram, every influencer is exercising the core the the choreographed movements and gun handling of shooting paper and steel like it's a zombie apocalypse, except that's not how it works. Right. Right. And 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 it's it's not only not how it works, but it's counterproductive because you're building bad training habits and scars where you enact the shot or enact the movement. And it's inappropriate for that position because you have to discriminate good from bad. You have to be able to make decisions on the fly. You have to manage stress. And so when I did this with scenario-based training with role players, I started realizing there's there's a bracket before the technical script is activated, and that's called the decision point, right? Before that, there's situational awareness, um, there's staging, there's different things you could do. But in the bracket of decision point, I also realized in teaching civilians and law enforcement and military across the country, no one specifically knew their decision point. Yeah. So if I said to you, what, you, like, what is your, what would be the situation in which you would use deadly force? Like, 
what is the protocol for you to actually activate deadly force? What would that be? Yeah, I would think I, I would probably say it's it's when once someone's hands have be actually made contact with you and become upon you. You know. Okay, so let's let's uh, that's a perfect example of this. So let's say we're in a bar and I grab you. Right. You going to shoot me and kill me? No. Okay. Because I don't break the law and take guns into bars, Mike. Well, let's say it's a bar. <laughs> it, the bar is serving. I got him. I got him. Non-alcoholic Bud Conversation Light. Conversation over. Non-alcoholic Bud yeah. Light. Okay. Let's say I but grab yeah. you. Right. And I say I'm going to kill you. You going right. to kill me? You going to no. use deadly force? No. Okay. Let's say I headbutt you. Right. You going to use deadly force? I'm starting to think about it, but it depends on how capable I think I am as a person to manage that from there. And well, we're talking about you. Right. See, this is this is what you just said is what most people do. They think external, right. and they think third party, and they think the legal ramification. But it's not just legal; it's moral, it's ethical, and it's it's behavioral. It's like right. triggers and trauma. What activates you? No, I'm definitely at that point hitting you. Okay. Well, <clears throat> let's say this. Let's say I. But, put, but the problem is, is I'm not a fighter, so. To, to be honest, like... You don't have to be. No. 90% of the people who go to my classes are soccer moms. But what I'm saying no is, is, is is I'm going to probably be more apt to, to panic and pull that gun out and shoot you before... Uh, I, I'm Mike, I am two days deep into jujitsu, and I'm pretty much an unstoppable force. I, I could tell. I know. Yeah. I can see the fear in your eyes. I can actually smell it on you. There I don't know if that's belt. the sweat from the... Uh, <laughs> it's that Bud Light the, pouring out of my pores. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, but... but to be to be honest, like it's a big reason why I started jujitsu. That and also that Andy's badgered me for a year and a half straight. Um, <clears throat> but uh, and a big part, and, and I'm taking my son Hank. And a big part of that is is um, I actually don't know the answer to your question here because if you're a very very capable person, I think you would have some tools and some techniques that you could use to defer that situation down the road. Continue that process down the road to the point where maybe you do then need to pull a gun out and shoot somebody. But without the proper training, which I'd say is 95% of the people walking around, you're going to panic and you're going to want to go for that gun really early in that process. And I actually don't know. I'm curious to see what, like, at what point do you think I should shoot you? Well, here's what I think. I, it's not my decision. It's yours. Yeah. And so when I, like, when I do a cognitive drill with you, that's the problem with our training. That's the problem with our society. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. No. Right? And so when I, whenever it I... Actually, the answer may vary based on the county you're in and the state you're in. I that's mean, a, it does vary. It does vary. Like if I'm in rural Montana and I do a scenario and I say, all right, there's a scenario I'm going to walk you through. And the guy comes into the house and um, whenever you want to use deadly force, you use deadly force. But I want you to definitively do something. Like I want you to shoot the target or I want you to sit on the ground to to demonstrate to everybody, including yourself, that you've made a, a sound decision in your mind and you're committed to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's no turning back. There's no standing back up. There's no not shooting the target. You're committing. And in rural Montana, I'll say, all right, the guy walks through the door and you'll have people sit down. Right. Like, okay, the guy walked through the door is your dad. It's your grandfather. Right. Like, I, let me get into the scenario. And then I could take it all the way through and go, it's black, it's dark, it's it's dark, and it's two in the morning, and the person gets to your child and puts what you see as an outline of a gun to your child's head, and you'll have people still standing. And I'm like, well, why haven't you sat? Like, I'm not taking the chance. And then I put my finger on the trigger, and then you sit. And then I say, then you turn on the lights, and it's a 14-year-old child that whose friend was in that Airbnb the night before, and you just killed a child. How do you feel? And people go, well, that's not how it works. I'm like, that's exactly how it works. Because the problem here with most people in self-defense, because they practice the thing on the range, shooting the paper and still, is they think they have control. Mm -hmm. Except when you're on the reactive side of self-defense, you're reacting. And so some guys will go, well, Mike, I would never do that because I would do this. And I said, how about I make a scenario where the guy just walks up to you in the middle of the night, puts the gun to your head and pulls the trigger. How do, how do you like that scenario? You're dead. You don't get any buy-in. Mm -hmm. well, well, what do you mean? You don't have to get rude. I'm getting rude because I'm telling you, you don't have a choice. And what you're forgetting because you comfortably shoot in your own zone, which is typically complacent and comfortable, and you fall in love with yourself, relaxed on a range that the component you're missing is stress. 
Right. Right. You're missing a sympathetic nervous response. You're missing your heart going, th- th- pumping out of your chest. Right. And that disassociates you and makes decisions different. And then when we do this for real, like, like uh, Leah went through it, all of a sudden you recognize, holy crap, I don't know anything. Right. And, and uh, to Leah's credit, a jujitsu practitioner at her level is a more resilient human being. For sure. But does that mean they're more capable of decision making? Does that mean they're more capable of using deadly force at the appropriate may, time? It actually may, may complicate it to the point where it would cost them their life because they would probably be uh, you know, slower to react to the point where maybe a normal person does actually stop that threat and it's the right decision. But somebody that's that capable has been taught that really you hear jujitsu people say it all the time. A big, a big part of, of knowing all those tactics and whatnot is to be able to actually talk and walk your way out of a fight and never have to go hands on. Yeah. Period. Yeah. To begin with. Yeah. But if it comes to that, they can handle themselves, but them handling somebody too long may result in that guy realizing what he's dealing with and pulling out his own gun and shooting you. hundred percent. I mean, let me give you a specific example. Cause I think this will resonate with some people who listen to this. There is, there is not a good correlation of military tactics as it relates to self-defense tactics for civilians, because the component we're missing is the rules of engagement, the yeah. rule of law, the Geneva convention and the rule of law in war via our ROE is how, how we practically apply it is very different. If I had a foreign safe house, and we were doing call-outs at the time because Al-Qaeda was blowing themselves up. And I said, hey, come out with your hands up. Nobody came out. I did, um, I would throw a flashbang. And they wouldn't come out. I'd throw a thermobaric flashbang. They wouldn't come out. Um, we might send the dog in. We might do a soft clear. And if we didn't have anybody coming out and they refused to come out, we would drop a JDAM on that entire thing. Maybe even throw an anti-tank weapon into it, a law into right. it and hit it a couple times, and then drop a J-dam. You can't do that in civilian life. Right. So the perfect example of this is a lot of military practitioners, a lot of tactical instructors teach tactics. And the problem is the tactics don't fit into the role a civilian in self-defense would, would apply. The example would be a retracted gun. So I take a pistol back, I retract it, and then I shoot it from basically my rib cage. I turn the gun sideways to clear the barrel and it's a close proximity shot. And I, I once had a kid who talked about this and said, Mike, why don't you teach that? And I said, okay, you're asking about this tactic and give me the specific justification for when you would use this. And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, when would you use this justifyingly? I said, you do realize that tactic is for close proximity gunfights. So, when would you use it? Well, I don't know. You know, I was in a bar and a guy headbutted me. And I said, okay, so the guy headbutts you. What do you do? Well, if, if he tangled with me and, we were, and he headbutted me and he grabbed me, and you pu- I would pull my gun and retract it and shoot him. I said, then you would go to prison for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because it's not the appropriate force that you're getting your ass beat by fist, by heads, and you're pulling a gun and shooting a guy in the gut stitching him up through his face. The reason right. we would do it is because our rules and engagement support it. We would come into a point of domination. I've had this happen multiple times. I've killed men for this. Grab my rifle. See what happens. Mm-hmm. The rules of engagement cover me. You grab my rifle, I'm not getting in a combatant fight with a terrorist who has a suicide vest set up to, to blast. Right. So I would activate. You do that as a civilian, you go to prison for the rest of your right. life. So the only way you could figure or navigate that is through scenario-based training. And Leah, who's an anomaly, I mean, she is, she is a rock star. She had a situation where because we were doing escalation of force, she tried to de-escalate it. And when she thought it was de-escalated, which was part of the whole premise of the scenario, the scenario took a turn. And the turn was the guy became less combatant and turned his back and walked away. And she was like so nice, and she mitigated the threat, except she didn't realize that he was getting her guard to come down so he could exploit the advantage. So he turned around, and her entire guard went down because she was like, oh, I did it. Except he pulled the gun slowly, turned around, and she was ill-prepared. But because she was so fast, 
She drew the pistol and got shots off simultaneously at the same time, which rarely happens, by the way. Most of the time, because there's a freeze response, the people get the gun pointed at them and they literally freeze. They don't access their pistol and they die in place. Mm -hmm. And so she drew it and she shot, except after the shots and the bad guy went down, she stood there and I said, index, the end of scenario. And she was still standing there. I said, Leah, and she snapped out of it. And she said, Mike, I don't know what happened. Like, I just froze. Like, after that happened, I was such in shock. My brain couldn't process it. And I said, you were hyper aroused. You literally got to a point where you had a sympathetic nervous response. You had cortisol, norepinephrine, all the things that are supposed to allow you to uh, survive the fight in a primal circumstance, mobilization tactic for survival, except you needed skills, tangible hand movements, you needed microcosms. You didn't need big muscle uh, movements. Right. And you drew that pistol and you shot, and then you were waiting for what's next, but your systems were out of whack, out of sync. Most people don't recognize that component of stress. Mm -hmm. So all the technical skills you have that you learn on the range have to be validated and exercised with a culmination of stress. Mm -hmm. In the military, we did it every single time because we'd have a day of flight. When I was a team sergeant, my guys would come out. I remember the first day of my 18 Bravos, which I was an 18 Bravo. They came out and said, Mike... Um, we're going to do a range. I said, fine, let's go to the range. We went out there, and my Bravos came out, and they said, hey, Mike, we're going to warm up on dots. I said, nope. And so what do you mean? Like, we always warm up on dots. I was like, you get one opportunity per training session to evaluate yourself and your expertise on what you're currently made of because you're not going to rise to the occasion. You're going to fall back to the level of training. Go get your kit on. Be prepared to do physical movement, scoreable targets in time, pressure, stress, and then we'll see what you're made of. They're like, what? And then we did it, and they made it a new part of the regime because you get that one opportunity. On, uh, on, in our training re regimes, we always had a stress shoot because you needed to see what you were made of under fire, under pressure, because that correlated to combat. And most people don't recognize that. And personal security as a baseline, which is our like level one, is the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, dude, it, it's a, it is the most profound learning experience not only for the students, but for me and our instructors. When we see these things take place, Casey uh, Hildreth, uh, former fifth group guy, A15 guy, um, is my training director. When we see these things take place and we see the learning that takes place where people go, oh my God, and then we condition them and we work them through it, the scenario, to improve, it is insane. It blows mm -hmm. your mind. It gives me chills because I, I'm, I'm in fear that the rest of the country doesn't realize this. Right. And we need to start paying attention to these kind of trainings and, and stop falling in love with the influencers who are only worried about shooting paper and steel as recognition that they're doing something right. It is a facet. It is, it's like tying your shoes. Like to wear your shoes, you need to tie your shoes. It's a facet, but it's not what's going to make you a marathon runner. It's not right. what's going to make you better at the sprint. Um, I think collective scenario-based training under stress is what's going to make you better. Yeah, it's 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 amazing, and it's <clears throat> it's something I'm sure I would utterly actually fail at. I mean, it would actually be it'd be really cool to have you come up here and um and and you know do one of your guys' classes here and I would have, love to have an event. I love our, to do use our old shop or something like that. I would and love we'll go through it. Um, <clears throat> and and it got to Leah, and you know the one thing we did discuss from a legality standpoint, it is always going to be debatable. Uh, depending on where you live, if you have a dead person laying in front of you at the end of it, I don't care if they're laying on top of you to your point with the bar point, like there's still no guarantee that you're not going to prison. And that's the one thing we discussed. And I, and I think there's uh, a lot of training that probably needs to go in with this as well. And I'm definitely not the guy I make knives, but I don't fight with them. But like she, like we talked about, with like that mini speed goat or with your field craft inside the waistband knife, you know, Kevin was instrumental in making sure that that was right. If you are grabbed in, in a bar or at a, at a party somewhere or walking home from the bar and you are grabbed and you are being wrestled with and you pull that knife out and you jab them in the arm or jab them in the leg, you're very likely not going to prison. Like at that point, it's clearly a hands-on situation, a clearly a self-defense situation that you were attacked in. And it's very likely you're not going to have a dead person laying in front of you. But one of the most important things, though, is you've got to break contact. So in that case, exactly what you're saying, yeah, you can use it, 
but you need to break contact because it's, if you then continue to use that force, that force is no longer reasonable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you think about it, that's why one of the reasons I don't care, carry defensive knives mm-hmm. is because when you create an escalation of force protocol as a civilian, you're creating a very dangerous precedent of somebody reacting to your escalation. Right, and escalating more. And escalating more. So you pull a knife, the guy's got a gun, and then he justifyingly shoots you because he argues and debates, hey, the guy stabbed me. Like, we were in a tussle. We were getting physical assault charges at a minimum, but then this guy pulled a knife, which is a deadly weapon, and he stabbed me. Right. And then I pulled the gun to defend my life, and likely, justifyingly, um, as long as it's well articulated, that person is in the right and you're in the wrong. So then what happens to you? Well, you go to prison. So I, I always I always do this. I always it, go, It's a tough debate. It's an interesting one because, like, if my daughter's out jogging at college on the M and jogging in Missoula on some trail and some weirdo grabs her on a trail, you know, she's likely not jogging with a pistol in her leggings and sports bra. Right. So at that point, does she have a field craft craft knife tucked in her leggings as some form of defense to keep from getting raped or, or whatever? Um, or like you say, it, it could definitely escalate it. I would argue that it would most likely she if if you get jabbed, stabbed, and sliced a couple times with a knife, you're going to likely turn most of your attention to your own injuries. I would I would think, and and on, I don't know how you feel about that, but well, there's a, there's a, there, for women there's a disparity in force based on size. Yeah, right. So a woman that's why I tell people like especially women train with a firearm. Why? Because I don't care, and Lee will tell you this. I don't care if you're a 120-pound black belt in every single martial art. I will pummel you to death. I am six foot one, 240 pounds. If I put my hands on you, I will pummel you to death. So the reason a tool is such an advantage for this disparity is because that 120-pound woman now has a fighting chance. Mm-hmm. The issue with a knife, the issue with mace and all the, non, the, the non-lethals is... They've been shown in every single way, especially through FBI statistics, um, officer involved shooting statistics, held YouTube, that they're not going to stop an attacker who's hell bent on creating and, and committing an act of violence. Mm-hmm. Right. So you stab me and you don't puncture my chest cavity. I'm even if you do do, I still have some time. And if I went to rape you and you stab me. You just turn that rape into a murder, right? right? And so you have to be very careful. Now, in a in an oodle loop and in an in a escalation of force, uh, where I, you know, your daughter's taught, hey, in close proximity, you can't get to your gun. You have the knife at your disposal. You could get there. The fanny pack that has your Glock forty three, that's your that that's the system you're going to to buy time. Right. Usually, all these softer tools are used to buy time, create distance, to allow me to get to the main weapon system, the main mm-hmm. source. Like I teach pistol shooters. I'm like, guys, if you have a pistol, your main objective should be fighting to the rifle, right? Right. So you're on the street, you're in this gunfight, you pull your pistol, man, do your best to get back to your vehicle and get that truck gun because you are at a distinct advantage with that small pistol in a gunfight as distance creates itself and that person has a rifle, Right. So we have to be very careful. And, and I think that's the important contrast is it's a conversation. There are no distinct ones and zeros. It's not binary. It is always, there is always gray. And like you said, the, the most distinct variability now is politics. Yeah. I mean, a, a army soldier who was part-time Ubering drops off a person at a protest, gets confronted with a man with a loaded AK-47, supposedly he didn't have one in the chamber, but... He has a loaded AK-47. Did he, he not sh- ask him? Is there one in the chamber? Yeah, of course. And he sh- and he, his gun was on safe, they said. It's like, yeah, because that's what you're paying attention to when a guy moves towards you with an AK-47 right. with aggression. He draws his pistol, he shoots, and he kills this guy. And he goes to prison for 25 years for murder. Are they, they're, still waiting. they're still waiting on the governor to hopefully 
Uh, I doubt it will happen. I doubt Pardon it. him. I doubt it. I mean, what he said is right because in Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground, they're setting a legal precedent that affects every self-defense case in the state of Texas for history and the country. And so it, it was the issue behind Rittenhouse. I, I raised $10,000 for Kyle Rittenhouse for his legal defense. After I talked to his lawyers and got every piece of intel and, and, and evidence that they had and made the decision to support him because it was a clear-cut case of self-defense. People hated me for it. People loved me for it. But I said, guys, what you don't understand is I have to be on the right side of the value system here because if he is charged and convicted because of politics, every single thing that I teach as a company that teaches self-defense would be changed for the rest of history. Yeah. Because And, and then your position you will be set up for failure for the rest of history, but for, for justified killings. You know, and, and I'm sure I, I, I've had these arguments with people, and you're never going to win them because it's an unwinnable argument with, with so many people. But um, I personally think the kid was a complete retard to be at whatever rally, protest, bullshit was going on, standing there as a teenager with an AR mm-hmm. in public. Like, does he have the right to stand there? I'm not arguing that he doesn't have the right. Would I allow my kid to go stand downtown Missoula during a, and these protests happen all the time down there, all these bullshit, stupid stuff, chaining themselves to the fucking bridge and logging trucks. He's an idiot for being, for putting himself, it was, it was in my mind, a, a mental error and a mistake to put himself in that situation. However, once You've even though you would maybe admit that that was a mistake. Once you are attacked and you are being pursued by a crowd of people, I don't care what triggered that. You have the right to defend yourself, and that was a thousand percent in my mind, absolutely justifiable self defense. Yeah, I mean, he was being attacked with a weapon, which was a skateboard initially, and then a gun was literally pulled out and on fucking television. Like, if that's not a self-defense uh, situation, there is no self-defense situation, period. Yeah. Like, that's it. That's it. If that if that case gets deemed not self-defense, then there is no such thing as self-defense. Yeah. If you look at the kid with the AK-47 in a protest that actually turned violent, he's a martyr. You yeah. know I mean, like, he, he was on the right side of history. I would say that Kyle Rittenhouse likely made a poor decision, but he was exercising everything legal and constitutionally he allowed was. and doing what he thought was the right thing. And he was. And, 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 and in my case, in my personal opinion, I don't care about what he was doing as long as he was doing it legally, right? Yeah. And so it, it, the, the fact was many of the young men that were there were actually being supported by police because they were standing guard and protecting people's businesses. And I agree with that. I do. I, I agree a hundred percent. In fact, he was interviewed before all of that. And you could tell he was just basically this nice young kid. We're down here. I don't think he had any grasp of the gravity of the actual situation that could happen as a, as a young kid. Yeah. Like you guys have, both of you have been to actual war. His, his risk assessment would have, would have failed my team room. Yeah. Right. So I that he didn't weigh the risk properly, but I'll tell you what, I, I, I was raised in small business. My mom started her small business in her house, tethered to her house in the garage, and she worked very hard to get that one chair salon turned into a spa. Right. And if my mom's place was in jeopardy, which it was, by the way, um, I deployed special operations guys that stayed in my mom's business with nods and lasers. Because people don't realize businesses as your business, my business, are our lifeline. And they're the lifeline of our employees. Now, however he was raised, whatever that is, we exercise, the the Koreans have exercised this as rooftop Koreans in LA when the Rodney King riots were burning everything to the ground. Right. If that was my business, I would be on the rooftop with a laser with nods and all my friends. Right. And you you go into my building based on the legal protocol of, of Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground, 
you will die in right. my business. And I think the biggest problem societally is we are not doing the right thing across the board. 100%. And then if, if Kyle Rittenhouse and, and that situation specifically was prosecuted, dude, I don't know how this would have turned out, but I would have went out of my way to make sure that through legislation, through every means necessary before things hit the fan, that I would go out of my way to make sure that this was changed. Because, again, legal precedent in this country is the slippery slope that we're sliding away from currently. Well, yeah, no, it's and, – and to be clear, I mean, I, I, I agree 100%. The problem was with his – you know, your execution of how you would defend a – well, and how you basically did defend a business, a small business – and his execution being on the ground, basically alone. Poor decision. With a gun, like, if anyone would have asked him, somebody with your background would have asked him, okay, if you're going to go do this tonight, what is your plan if this happens? 100%. What is what is your plan if somebody blindside punches you? Yeah. Like, you just, just asked shoot you, you, just, you. you just asked me all these questions. Yeah. That, that, that is going to happen when you go in a mob mentality and you're, you're, the one cowboy and you're surrounded by all these people that's going to somebody is going to dare you because there's idiots in those yeah. crowds they're all idiots in those crowds yeah, i mean poor decision. get a goddamn job people yeah those people are idiots somebody is going to make a poor decision and hit you or tempt you to shoot them and Which now you happen now you've reached the de de decision point yep and he actually and again i argued this he tried to it's, it's, it's to, he tried to escape. Yeah, he, he tried, tried to, to get away from it. He ran yeah. from it. He got chased, and he got chased. He tripped. He fell. Self defense all day long, every day. I just, I still, as much as I believe in that small business and whatnot, I just think the way that it was executed, especially for a teenage kid with no life experience and probably little to no training whatsoever, like you said, steel target warrior, maybe. And I doubt he was even maybe that. Maybe he was. Um, but it doesn't matter, like you said, steel target, uh, paper target guy is so much different than someone who has to make decisions and you're placing yourself on the ground, not on the rooftop, on the ground in, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame that, um, it's just a shame that our politics of our country, ultimately who's guilty for that are the politicians who even allow that situation to arise. Yeah. Because they're the ones who told the law enforcement officers to literally back off and let it burn. And to be clear, it's not the protesting that I think our politicians should be stopping. You have the right to protest mm. all day long. When you touch someone else's property, it should be the police standing there with the AK or tear gas or rubber bullets or sandbags and absolutely laying waste to those people. As soon as the first rock's thrown through a window... Yeah. Now we disperse. When that happened to our entire country, and now, you know, I talk about 2024, that's the slippery slope. Yeah. A law enforcement officer in the middle of a protest defends his life. I'm so surprised it just didn't happen during those civil protests, mainly in BLM and Antifa, but a lot of people were murdered from BLM and Antifa. And quite honestly, had they... Had they taken the actions they probably should have, that kind of stuff probably would have happened. Instead, they just let it happen. They let they, it happen. Those police officers know that they would probably be on trial. Yeah. And if that happens in 2024, you get one police officer that shoots whatever, and then they go off and start shooting cops and all the cops. The military gets involved. It's, it's not hard to a path to complete destruction in major metropolitan cities. Well, and because we've really, quite frankly at this point, really in a lot of places, almost um, forfeited entire s giant swaths of some of these major cities where there's really little to no police policing happening, yeah. happening at all. Yeah. Um, it's a scary situation. Talk real quick before we quit, quick, uh, before we wrap up here, this whole situation with being deemed a domestic terrorist i wanted to cover because you guys do all this training like all this stuff is all a frankly a service it's it's a service to actually help prevent situations like even like written houses decision making um the mindset being prepared how to deal with conflict all these different things that you guys and then teaching preparedness teaching how to escape and evade a situation back off de-escalate um what 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 happened with all that because i saw you 
you, you were all over Fox News. Um, didn't you go to Congress and testify? Mm, no, I never. Or went you to weren't. Congress. You weren't to Congress. I went. To, I, went to, I did Tucker's. I did. I okay. did. I talked to congressmen. Okay. Um, I mean, it started with what we were kind of just talking about. It started with um, a group that I started called American Contingency, which started from the mayor of Seattle telling the Seattle Police Department to not basically police their community right? unless it was a mass casualty. And so you have unanswered calls of rape, of assault, and even murder where officers never responded and were told not to respond because the chief of police put it out. Yeah. Based on the orders received from the mayor. And that's an email. You can go online and find it. And later, the chief of police, a black female, she winded up uh, walking away from the job because she was disgusted with how this was going down. And I don't blame her. I don't blame law enforcement. I blame the politics. I, I've been affected that way in the military where I've seen policymakers affect the ability from the um, top down for the guys on the ground to do their job. Even Greg Anderson with the whole COVID situation. Yeah, with, with it was, it was Seattle disgusting. Seattle Police Department. Yeah, yeah. It, ha- it happened. And I started this group with the idea like, hey, man, we need to get back to basics. Communities don't know each other, right? You don't know your neighbor. We don't have a means of communicating. So I started an online forum, this system to help support each other in natural and man-made disasters, civil unrest, hurricanes, tornadoes. I mean, it's, effect, it's being ef- effective across the entire nation. I mean, every major disaster, we've played a role. Mm-hmm. We don't advertise it. We don't give ourselves accolades. But every major disaster, American Contingency has mobilized and moved to those locations to help people on the ground. Right. And that's an important mission because it's just getting back to community basics. A leftist article was written by a leftist journalists who belong to a leftist organization. And when that was published, USA Today republished it and it blew up. And when that happened on the back end, they went after my business. So I find out later through Project Veritas as they leak the document that the US government contacted through email chains, all these social media platforms, and they literally blacklisted me as a business owner and on social media and started targeting me through the FBI, right? So the weaponization of the justice system and many other entities that they affected. Shopify. I did millions of dollars of revenue the year they shut me down, which is years ago. And they said, you have 48 hours to pull off your information and we're going to shut you down. My entire business shut down. I couldn't even access my website that I built on the platform to save it. I had to pull all my user data, me and my CMO, who's my CMO today, Rob Parsons, we spent 72 hours with no sleep, stand, staying up and rebuilding a site. I even went out and said, hey guys, I don't know what's going on here, but my entire business just got shut down and suppressed. Um, can I, I'm gonna sell hats. And I sold $20,000 worth of hats because of community support, just yeah. to keep the business afloat. Yeah. And then um, when it came out, Project Veritas leaked it. The FBI did an investigation on me. They went through my DD-214, my ERB, my enlisted records, my VA records, and went through everything and determined at some point, I I likely because of a hostage rescue team member that I worked with overseas in Afghanistan, um, that he shut that guy down who's an open source analyst for the FBI, but not after they did all these things. I will say that I received a public or a non-public formal apology from the FBI from a high supervisor who personally drove out to communicate to me. And I also received many informal apologies, including heads of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And that feels good. But I am afraid that organizations, specifically the FBI, are being weaponized. And I don't know if justifyingly they still need to exist. And I hate saying that because the men of HRT, the men of regional SWAT teams, a lot of these men and women who serve in these regional offices bust their ass for this country. And I I literally got hired as a tactical, from the tactical recruiting program, the TRP program, to be an FBI agent. I made it, it, I got a date for Quantico. It's like being a truck driver for Bud Light right now. 
One hundred percent. A lot of really good employees for Bud Light that yes can't control what dumbasses they, they can, do. They don't. Job. They can't do anything. But I think at the senior level, it's being demonstrated right now with all the things that are going on with the director of the FBI now, all the collusion, the the fake hoax, all the drama. And they went after me. And if they went after me, they went after many other Americans. Well, I mean, and that sucks. It, it's been proven. I mean, say what you want. Believe what you want about Donald Trump. Uh, you know, with the, with the last election, uh, the whole Twitter file situation, it's all been laid right out in public, frankly. Yeah, but except nobody's heard about it because it's suppressed and, on national media. And, and it's been, you know, the, the FBI, CIA, they all worked in, in conjunction with each other and literally worked in conjunction with these social media companies to purposely suppress things like, the Biden laptop and purposely push other things out on social media. I mean, your whole point about the FBI being weaponized, if they can do it to the sitting president, who the hell's Mike Glover? I mean, they can do it to anybody. hundred percent. And that's the scariest thing. Like, like you said, two directors, one existing, one former John Brennan directors of CIA. I worked under Brennan. Um, I, I worked on the prior director of that. And then Brennan, they colluded together to basically try to change the outcome of the election. Right. And that is very apparent, except there's no consequence. And my no, pr- no one's in prison. How yeah. are there no- How is that possible? How is that possible? I, I, and, That's my and only beef with the whole if thing. It was, if it was Trump and his organizations that did it to Biden, I would want the same amount of people in prison. Hundred percent. I mean, free and fair elections across the board. It's that's that's what the company like if and actually what concerns me the most about 2024 is the fact like we we heard all this shit actually when Trump got elected the first time and it went to you know this whole Russia gate thing and it went to you know it was first it was Hillary and it was Trump and Hillary was arguing also that the election was was rigged or stolen or not fair in certain places like this has been going on right or left I don't give a shit about your beliefs right or left doesn't matter at all it's happened on both sides, and they both scream the same stuff. But here's the problem. After the last election, not a single thing's been fixed. Nothing. They, they haven't really investigated and fixed any potential problems, all the mail-in situations. Nobody's been fired. No one's been fired. There's nothing that's, that's, uh, nothing that's been standardized with our system that keeps the elections. Like, how, how can they count, you know... 200 or how can they count, you know, 200, 300, 400,000 votes in one place and then take days to count 10,000 in another place. Like none of this makes any sense and none of it's been fixed. And what it does, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. It stokes the flames of controversy right or left. It doesn't matter if like, imagine the, the fire that will be in this country if Trump's elected actually again in in the presidential election because the other side will be screaming that stuff. Oh yeah. And vice versa. Either way we matter. lose. Either way. The people lose. That's why I think it's most important that we prepare. And we've got a wheelchair race going on between a two 80 year olds. It's it's mind boggling. You would not hire an 80 year old to run Fieldcraft Survival. Not one on the planet. No. It's mind boggling. It's the most important job in the world. Yeah. But none of these issues have been fixed and you know go down the whole rabbit hole of, you know, I think we need term limits and we need an upper age limit too. Like, if you wouldn't, I wouldn't hire anybody over 75 to run Montana Knife Company. Why would they run the free world? Yeah, that's too logical. That's That's too reasonable. Mind-boggling. Yeah. But that's the thing about 2024 that worries me the most about anything is this is now a precedent that we've seen over the last eight years. And the first time it was a rumble and it, it kind of went on with Trump and Clinton, the last time was a complete shit show. And what's the next time going to be like? Mm. It's actually quite scary, that part of it. It's the scariest part of what's going on right now. We've never seen it before, and here we are. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for being here. We should uh, probably wrap this up. You poor wife's in the uh, We didn't hit record. In the house, what? yeah. It's all, it's all Ranger Rick's <laughs> fault. Yeah, that's my fault. <laughs> Ranger I'm Rick. Still, Ranger still, Rick is the new name. No, that's sure. a call no, sign. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, call sign. <laughs> Poor Andrew. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. I appreciate um, having. I really appreciate your company. I appreciate your friendship. Um, 
we're, we're proud, uh, even though you're a domestic terrorist, we are proud to work with you. The best terrorist. Yeah. Number one on the HVT list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. So, uh, and this isn't on audio. This is on audio, right? It is. You you read it. I did. That, uh, that would be, um, like you say, that would be a difficult, that would be a difficult job having to like. It took three days and I forgot how to read. Like literally at points I could not read anymore. My brain was like, you can't do, you're not doing this anymore. Well, and that's how I listen to, that's how I listen to all Jack's, any books I do. I, yeah. Ray Porter yeah, does the voice for Jack Carr in the in the. Uh, does the he use best. a different accent like in the Jack Carr books? No, but does he does. He's very like like again. It's like I want to see. I want to hear Jack Carr's uh, voice that Ray Porter does. Like, but I'd want it to be yeah. to go like way over the top. It's it was super sexy, and then you get to my voice, and I'm like, God, he I, I wasn't as dramatic as he was. He's so good. He's man. so good. The opening of that book is my favorite part which sucks for the reader or the listener. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After that, it's just all downhill. So you're starting with dessert when you read this? That's it, you're exactly. You're starting with the chocolate Read cake. it backwards so you won't be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. Uh, I hope it absolutely crushes for you. And uh, um, I can't wait to take one of your classes. And we should definitely do some of those classes right here. We should. It's easy. Yeah, it'd be fun. We do them in Kalispell, so it'd be easy to do one down here. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Screw Kalispell. <laughs> and Billings. <laughs> Screw Billings. All right. All right, man. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, man.